Що ви нам ізді? Αυτό τώρα τι είναι σημαίνει εκεί που έχει βγάλει. Μόνο πίσω. Νομίζω πας το ποντίκι. Τι είναι το γυαλό. Το γυαλό κάνει τη δουλειά σου και μετά θα το δίνει. Να βάλω το δικό μου στο γραφείο μου. Όχι σήμερα. Είναι αυτό τώρα. Αυτό βάζουμε. Φιλετικό. Φιλετικό. Το βάζουμε. Και πάλι το προηγούμενο. Αυτό νομίζω το κάνεις από το φωτάς από τον προτζέκτορα, εκεί πάνω σε αυτό. Εντάξει. Ωραία, παίζει. Κάτσε να βγάλω το safe. Δεν θέλει πολύ ανάλυση, έχεις κάτι πολλά στο πιλωτικά. Όχι. Πόσο θέλει. Ε, δέκα λεπτά. Αυτό, το πολύ, ναι. Θέλω εγώ γρήγορα. Θυμάσαι. Αυτό είναι το κατάλληλο ποιο είναι. Έτσι το έχει σκάσει. Ινδιάνο. Είναι σε τάκι με τη γιαγιούλα. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm making enemies now. Oh, 
Just checking, are there any more slides that we need to load? version of uh, yeah. Windows and Geomic. So you're in there. So that should be okay anyway. I'm not quite sure what's what though. Do you have any slides? Uh, yes, I did have a few slides. Okay. Uh, we just arrived yesterday at night. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> we said a 24 hour travel. <laughs> ah, just check there's a problem with the disk, the disk drive. drive. This drive is not mm. actually yep. a bit open, I guess. Yeah. Geoplenary? Yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, I think take this first one. First one? Just copy this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I quickly open it and see if it's right? Well, you could if it had gone, but it hasn't yes. copied. It hasn't copied. So I just need to. It's not this one? No, I don't think so. Oh, okay. No, it's not. Oh, my goodness. There it is. Okay, great. <laughs> So we just, as you say, we just check it. So there you go. It's okay. I hope it's the right one. Right, thanks. <laughs> That's yeah. fine. Oh, it's the wrong one. It's the wrong one? There's no name and stuff. Okay, let me just copy something. Okay. okay. Wait, can you put this? You just close the wrong one. You can put it. J no, no, there's a few slides. J can you please close it? Can you delete it? I think it's some outside the folder thing. I think it's outside that folder. Okay. It's outside the folder, just close it. Yeah. Yeah, just take this one. Yeah, that yeah. should be a problem. Because I removed your slide. <laughs> With the, uh, with your slides, with, uh, I start with. Uh, well, better I start with my own last slide. Yeah. I mean, just to say good morning, and then I yeah. can invite you to say again good morning, and then yeah. we continue. There you go. Okay. okay. And um, good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I think we can start because uh, time is running fast. Good morning. 
my name is Harris Kondoes. I'm uh, the coordinator of the GeoCredit project. <laughs> Uh, this is a meeting which is uh, a side event actually which is organized together by the European Association of Remote Sensing Company, Companies with my colleague uh, Jeff Sawyer. Uh, I'm delighted to have you all here. Uh, I'm uh, actually uh, inviting you to follow the works of this meeting which is, um, which is uh, a meeting on uh, identifying, communicating and delivering the value of the Earth observations. And uh, what we'll try to highlight today is the importance of sustained earth observation activities at regional level. Uh, I have to remind here that uh, GeoCredl is a coordination action that is funded by the European Commission, by the Horizon 2020 uh, program, and uh, all our activity is the coordination of earth observation activities in uh, neighboring regions of the European Union, uh, uh, that is uh, North Africa, Middle East, and uh, the Balkans. The meeting of today is uh, actually a workshop. Uh, we would like to be a workshop. We have organized uh, four roundtable discussions. And the main aim of this workshop is to showcase to you real examples uh, which depict the importance of sustained earth observation data and services in the downstream sector uh, to demonstrate uh, how these uh, sustained earth observation uh, services uh, become today uh, meaningful by the advent of uh, the Copernicus uh, data, uh, the use of big satellite data, uh, together with the emergence of new business models. We would like to discuss with you and receive your feedback on uh, the different approaches, best practices and uh, plans that uh, we have in mind towards the coordination of the earth observation activities. Uh, coordination which is to be undertaken through the GeoCradle project, but also in the future as GeoCradle initiative, but also through the other European Union uh, coordination actions and uh, um, uh, big geo initiatives like such as uh, EuroGeos, the new uh, geo initiative which is supported by the European Union and that has been launched a year ago. We would like to explore with you and uh, see how it's possible to closer to closely collaborate uh, with the European uh, Union industry and uh, to find ways towards the development of sustainable earth observation services and products. My colleague uh, Monica uh, Delago from the European Association of Remote Sensing Companies uh, will uh, provide you insights of uh, what has been the assessment of the regions in relation to the earth observation, the maturity of the regions in relation to the earth observation and uh, how we could uh, communicate them better all of the uh, capacities which become available today through the European Union flagships uh, uh, for the development of sustainable earth observation services in those regions. And last uh, but not least, and I think this is the end of the meeting of today, is a panel discussion on uh, what we are proposing as a roadmap for the future implementation of GEO and Copernicus in those regions. Uh, we have um, uh, actually identified several actions, coordination actions, but also uh, plans for the development of activities in those regions, but at the same time to engage the stakeholder community in those regions uh, towards the uh, uh, uptake and implementation of Geos and Copernicus in those regions. So this is uh, more or less uh, the workshop of uh, the day. Uh, we'll uh, have the opportunity to discuss on all these issues in uh, four different panel discussions. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, my colleague Jeff Sawyer, for the co-organizer of this event, to say good morning to you, and then we start uh, immediately with the first panel. Thank you. So thanks, Harris, and uh, thanks everyone for, for being with us this morning. Um, we have designed uh, the side event around uh, looking at the value of Earth observation, partly in order to, uh, to follow on from uh, an activity and to provide some continuity with an activity last, uh, last year. Um, as, the, uh, as we got closer to the, to the event, um, we decided to put it into context with the, uh, the work that we've been doing as well on, on GeoCradle and that we would uh, organize this as a joint event with the uh, sort of structure that uh, Harris has already uh, been through. So last year, I want to just talk a little bit about the workshop from last year because uh, there's proceedings that will be, will be issued very shortly. Um, we looked at 
thematic okay. market product or geographical baselines as a, as a reason, as a rationale for looking at uh, value. And that's how we came to, uh, to, to come to the regional approach. So last year, the GeoValue Group held a, the, the Workshop of Society event in Washington. Um, the, the, the full report is under peer review at the moment, so it will be published very shortly. Um, you have the, uh, the look and feel of it there. Um, and it's understanding and quantifying uh, socioeconomic benefits coming from uh, the value of Earth observation to demonstrate the value. And I, I put this announcement here. Uh, I'll try to remember to uh, remind everybody at the end, but there will be a new event on uh, G the GeoValue Group, which is planned for the first week in July uh, next year to be hosted by ESA in uh, Frascati. So number of findings that came out from the group um, to understand. The first one, that how important it is to understand the value of Earth observation to be developed, to uh, understand the, um, uh, the societal benefits coming from the, the Earth observation, and to provide some quantified estimates, as well as the narrative one of the key things that came out last year was the importance of communication around these, uh, uh, these showcased uh, case studies, as, as Harris has mentioned. Um, it needs a multidisciplinary approach in order to fully understand what's going on. Um, we extend the, the value chain concept beyond the production of information so that rather than just looking at the, the value of the data or the imagery itself, we're looking at the impact on society and I think that's a, a key message that hopefully we can develop further in the, uh, the, session, uh, the sessions even today. Case studies provide a, a strong um, approach. They a, uh, assist the communication. And as I said, the story is import as important as the numbers. And uh, I'll say more about that later. And understanding the way that these uh, products and services are impacting the value chain also provide good feedback on the, the whole system and what can be done to improve the system and the products and services that are being, uh, being uh, offered. So we'll come to the session um, later, the third session specifically on value, but then the overall agenda is linked into the, um, the, the geographical dimension. So looking first at the importance of sustained activities at the regional level understand how cooperation internationally can drive the, uh, the benefits of Earth observation, particularly with a focus on regions. Um, then from research to business, so R&D is the motor. How do we ensure that that's carried forward into commercial exploitation? Uh, that, my own particular perspective, of course, R&D doesn't, doesn't have a commercial objective, but um, that's the, the, the angle that I come from. Measuring the value. The, the, the session where we'll look at the, uh, the value chain analysis. And then how do we put this into a plan to develop for the future? So how do we develop a strategic roadmap and uh, with a, a concrete plan? So that's what we have uh, for this morning, uh, these, the four panels. And I will immediately hand back to, uh, to Harris, who will uh, take care of the first, uh, first panel. Over to you, Harris. So is it your, is your presentation and there's the, uh, let's minimize that one. If you go down here, yours is open, yours is open. Thank you. Okay, and um, I mean, before I, I open the panel discussion, I would like to say a few words about the GeoCreate project. Of course, uh, GeoCradle is a project uh, I mentioned before. It is a coordination action funded by the European Commission. And the main aim of this project uh, has been to coordinate and integrate state-of-the-art uh, Earth observation activities in the regions of uh, North Africa, Middle East, and uh, the Balkans. And uh, we have been, uh, let me see. And uh, we have been uh, linking to uh, main uh, geo initiatives and uh, EU flagships like uh, Copernicus and uh, also Afrigeos and uh, Eurogeos. Uh, Geocrate projects uh, bring together key, key players from uh, the three regions. 
and uh, all our activity is to engage them and uh, uptake the exploitation of Earth observation in uh, the North Africa, Middle East and the Balkans. We have uh, been doing a lot in towards uh, networking and cooperation of these countries, uh, awareness raising of uh, European uh, Union support mechanisms, capacity building, uh, sharing of uh, data. We are training uh, the countries about the open data sharing principles and um, creating data sets that are uh, using open standards. And last but not least, as I mentioned already, we are uh, trying to set and we are proposing to the European Commission their roadmap towards the uptake and the implementation of GEO and Copernicus in those countries. Um, uh, in, 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 only in all GEO Cradle is a project that it is addressing the entirety of uh, societal benefit areas of GEOs, disaster, energy, food security, public health and water management. And uh, it is um, uh, trying to, to, to provide support towards reporting different of the targets of sustainable development goals, mainly uh, zero hunger, affordable energy, climate change, life on land and sustainable cities. Uh, in this project, I mean, uh, which started three years ago, the, one of the main uh, actions uh, at the early stages of this project has been to make a thorough analysis of what is the state of the art in those areas. We identified and uh, we reported that we assessed what has been the, the, the gaps in those areas, what is the level of maturity of those countries and the stakeholder community in those countries in relation to the Earth observation. And at the same time, we were able to identify needs and priorities that are common at uh, regional level. We built uh, uh, capacity around the stakeholder uh, community, around the Earth Observation, the stakeholder community. We organized several regional workshops in less than two years. We have, uh, uh, we have organized 16 regional workshops in many different countries over the three regions. And uh, we created a network of stakeholders which accounts today for more than 200 stakeholders from uh, across the entire value-added chain. And uh, we have uh, organized them into the so-called networking platform, which is an open platform available on our website, uh, a database which is very easily searched and uh, which can provide you insight of uh, what is out there, how many, which are the entities, what are their profiles, what is their uh, maturity in relation to Geo Copernicus and Earth Observation. I mean, it is a networking platform that facilitates uh, the uh, partnership uh, um, of, uh, and the collaboration between European uh, entities and uh, organizations in North Africa, Middle East and the Balkans. One of the main activities of the project has been the development of the so-called Regional Data Hub, which is an advanced data uh, portal, a brokering mechanism that allows the access of the stakeholder community to a million of data sets of geo-information. Uh, geospatial data sets available through the GEOS portal, but also through uh, other uh, open portals, uh, including Inspire portals or national um, uh, data portals that are using open standards. We have been registered through the GeoCrate project into the GCI platform and uh, then became available to the, to the countries, uh, so accessing uh, facilitating the, 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 the entities to access to the data uh, for their own works and the development of their own uh, services, research and businesses. And last but not least, this uh, project, this GeoCredit project has developed uh, services uh, which have the form of web services for um, addressing or uh, meet priorities of the countries in relation to um, uh, four thematic areas which are shown here, adaptation to climate change, improved food security and water extreme management, access to raw materials and access to solar energy. Uh, I will um, I mean, just to mention that all these uh, services are open and available through the GeoCradle website. Uh, and um, the networking platform also available and uh, access through the website. Uh, it is uh, providing um, an overview and um, information on many different entities which have been registered into this network platform and uh, which of course I mean, may be easily searched by applying um, simple uh, free text uh, queries uh, uh, with criteria relating to the region, to the country, to the thematic area uh, or to the role of the organization into the value uh, adding sector. So this, uh, this slide shows you that uh, we have uh, uh, met with uh, many different people from different countries. It was uh, an activity in a multilingual, multicultural and uh, uh, multinational 
international environment. Uh, actually, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with different people. Uh, we trained them about the GEO and Copernicus, but at the same time, we were able to identify their needs and tell so what are their skills and what are their capacities that they could be linked into the implementation, uh, into actions for the implementation of uh, Copernicus and GEO in, the, uh, in these countries. So here you see that uh, during the last years, uh, we have uh, visited uh, many different countries in North Africa, uh, Balkans and Middle East. Uh, so you see, you see many of them, and uh, this is an activity that will proceed, uh, will continue for the next years because uh, GeoCradle, although it's ending as a European Union uh, project, it has been um, uh, 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 upgraded into the Geo Regional Initiative. initiative. Uh, that means that we are expanding, uh, we will continue to sustain all this uh, activity, we will sustain the network of stakeholders, uh, we will uh, sustain the operation of the regional data hub uh, and all our activities towards capacity building. We are expanding the thematic areas, um, uh, so we are uh, in, in engaging more um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, thematic areas that are linked to more sustainable development goals, including disasters and climate climate change, uh, but also we are expand all this activity into the other uh, regions, uh, including uh, Black Sea. So, um, I think uh, more or less I gave you an overview of what host GeoCrel has already uh, achieved as a coordination and capacity building action in uh, those areas. And uh, I think uh, at this time, uh, it's the right time that we open the panel uh, discussion. I would like to invite on the stage our panelists, uh, Franz Himmler from uh, European Commission, Monica Miguel Glago from the European Association of Remote Sensing Companies, and Steve Ramaz from uh, Geosecretaria. Uh, so please, uh, if you want to come here. Okay, uh, so we, uh, I mean the, the, the scope of this uh, panel discussion is about the uh, capacity building and uh, programmatic insights from uh, Geosecretaria and the European Commission uh, the president from ESME on about long-term action supporting uh, regional coordination. And um, I would like to start with the first question, which is actually addressed uh, to all the panelists. I would like to have your opinion, uh, I mean, uh, about the first question, which is uh, the one. Uh, I think that we all consider important to have coordinated uh, earth observation activities at regional level. Uh, first of all, I would like to know that uh, you agree on that and uh, you do believe the same. And uh, I would like to know from you what you believe are the key challenges uh, towards achieving a good capacity building at uh, regional level. Uh, maybe we start from uh, Steve. Huh? Okay. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to have a participatory audience. Um, so, regional um, participation. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing, so, I, I, so my name's Stephen Ramage, I work at the Geo Secretariat. Um, my role is working across the different um, areas of stakeholder engagement, so the work we do on the Paris Agreement, the work we do in the Sendai Framework, and the work we do with the SDGs, and I'm also responsible for our commercial sector engagement and uh, work very closely with Maddie on our communications. Just making sure you're paying attention, Maddie. So, um, w one of the things I've, I've probably 
been thinking mostly about in the last 12 to 18 months is how how do countries respond to different levels of drivers? So in every government there are national priorities and those quite often have nothing to do with earth observations. So they could be to do with poverty, they could be to do with social welfare, they could be to do with housing or other things. So earth observations can sometimes inform or provide insights for those areas but they're not necessarily one-to-one uh, -one link between them. So they have the national priorities, then they have the, um, they will have uh, national earth observation programs and they'll have other activities that those are driving. Then they will have things like um, continental activities. So if I take something like Agenda 2063 in Africa, that's for the whole continent. So people are thinking about the national activities in their country, then they're thinking about the continental. And then there's another layer, which is the international or the global perspective. So the things I mentioned, the Sendai framework, the Paris Agreement, all of these things where you have to report. And I think it's really hard to be an expert or to be aware of all these different areas. So that's where I think having the regional networks really help because it helps you to understand how other people are responding to their, nas to their own national priorities, but also to um, if they're in the same continent, how they're responding to the same shared vision for the continent, and then for the international one to look at good practice. So it's kind of like a, a tiered approach, but I don't think anyone can do it on their own. So that's kind of like, th there are many parts to this answer, but that's really the, the one I've seen the most, that where people want the biggest help is around the policy stuff and good practice, so they can save sort of time and effort and learn from others on what they're actually doing. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Steve. Monica, what do you think about? Yeah, well, first, uh, well, many of you in, uh, know me, but I'm from ERSC, the European Association of Automotive Sensing Companies. However, uh, here today, I'm not going to represent the industry as a such, but as a partner for the GeoCradle, because it gave us the opportunity to better understand how the sustainability of, um, of a project could, could fit into these regional needs. And for me, these are mainly the, the challenges, is the identification of the right needs. Uh, because we talk about a region which is a, a, a kind of umbrella under different countries. So the complexity behind is that the different countries have different uh, um, uh, maturity in the, in the development of the of the EO service development. So the, the, one of the main challenges will be, be that one. So to, to overcome this, um, this, uh, uh, well, this fence will be that uh, we need to, to, to look into the, the, to, into the planning, into the roadmap. So this roadmap for understanding will, will build into a few elements that will be coming from the cooperation perspective, from the capacity, uh, capacities perspe perspective, and then with the, the awareness or or and the uptake for for the for the users. So with these uh, major pillars, uh, we need to build all together the puzzle. So the, with. I'm oh, sorry, I thought that you were just throwing the slides. <laughs> uh, so having this puzzle together is, is building this, um, this uh, identification of common needs. Um, so basically, I, I see this perspective. The challenge for me is really to work under the, this, uh, this bottom-up and bottom-down approach, all actors working together and be able to, to enhance the, the knowledge of the existing capacities as a summary, uh, to build the, the, all the network together with the, the actors, uh, tackling the, um, the uptake, with tackling the regional needs and the common interest, and finally put together the best coordination for setting the, the stage. So that will build the, the, this challenge. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Monica. And Charles. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so in Europe, um, of course, we do have already a very good track record of co cooperation and coordination in Europe on many levels. We have uh, Copernicus program, for example, which is a European program. We have uh, ESA and UMETSAT and a lot of organizations that coordinate Earth observation assets uh, within Europe. But still there are <clears throat> quite some challenges and one of those I would say is there's still of course a big difference in the different member countries, particularly if you look at the old member countries and EU 13 countries in their capabilities. And um, then there's still even among the other countries quite some fragmentation if I look in GEO because there's national mm -hmm. GEO activities 
and there's EU uh, activities based on mainly what we support in the framework program Horizon 2020. And there's not always coordination among these different uh, strands that, that are going on at these levels. And then I think we also always have to realize that the EU is not, uh, is not by itself. Uh, the way the European Union is built, it's 28 sta states of Europe, but that's not Europe. And that's uh, also very closely linked to the rest of the world. So, of course, we have to look also on the other countries in Europe that are not EU member states. Uh, particularly in Eastern Europe <clears throat> and cooperate, try to cooperate, organize cooperation there and I think that's one example where GeoCradle has played a very important role. And the same then also for non-European countries, particularly Africa, our closest neighbor in Asia um, and then also all the rest of the world. So we see ourselves also in the middle of, you know, all of a geopolitical situation or geo situation where we have to cooperate at all levels with, with uh, all other countries. Okay, thank you, Franz. If I may add here, I mean, uh, for us, I mean, GeoCradle, one of the main challenges that we have uh, reported, uh, I mean, in this uh, capacity building activity we did in, uh, we ran in uh, GeoCradle, has been the, um, the possibility or the capability of uh, the stakeholders in those areas to access to, to the information uh, in regard to what are the European Union uh, investments, including Copernicus, including data, access to the data, but access to the information. I mean, uh, uh, we realized that uh, uh, we said uh, to provide a lot about uh, what are the different uh, EU funding or supporting mechanisms, let's say, uh, not only for funding their own activities, but also for training them or for um, uh, advancing their maturity level in, 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 in training in relation to the Earth observation. And even more a challenge, the main challenge for, uh, for us, at least what we have been uh, uh, realizing still, I mean, in different countries we, are, we, we, we visit, is their capability in accessing to the data. They, they do have very limited um, uh, capability in accessing to data, to Copernicus data, although for Europeans it's rather uh, obvious and straightforward to get access to the big satellite data for them. I mean, it's uh, difficult even to maintain a website, I mean, because they do not have the right the line connections, etc., etc. And um, I mean, at least uh, from, from my, 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 my understanding is that uh, one of the main challenges to, tr to, to make or not only to train, but also to support in developing the right uh, mechanism, let's say, but also infrastructure so that they are able enabled to access to the data because we are investing a lot of day on data, but uh, this data is not that usable, useful for them. I don't know what uh, you believe, but... Uh, so I, I have a perspective on this. Um, we, we talk a lot about capacity building where people fly in and fly out, and it has to be more done in the countries. So in Latin America, by Latin Americans, for Latin Americans, rather than people coming in. And Gilberto, my new boss, talks about this a lot from the global north to the global south. Um, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment, well, actually a program, is we're trying to raise several tens of millions of dollars for Digital Earth Africa. And so Digital Earth Africa is building on what our, our good friends from Australia started with Digital Earth Australia. And really, we're taking this approach to, it's everything you said. Um, what, what we're building is this um, concept of analysis-ready data. So the... Amazon call it the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Now, in, in, in plain English, what that means is 85% of the work you do is around data cleaning, validation, calibration, pre-processing, all of that work. And the, the whole point of the, um, the analysis-ready data is that all that stuff's done, so the heavy lifting's done. And so, the, so a lot of the challenges you've talked about are, are taken away by that. So we're building this for the whole of Africa. That's the plan is to build a continental product that is paid for. And it's done not just over a three-year project, but it's done over a 15 to 25-year program. So that, that's something that hopefully will change how we start to think about doing some of these things and about the long-term co-design and co-production of knowledge as opposed to just going in and doing training. Okay, thank you, Steve. And uh, now I think I should pass to the next uh, questions because, I mean, uh, time is passing 
uh, running fast. Uh, and the first question, I think, is again to Steve. Sorry, Steve, I mean, it's <laughs> again you. Uh, okay, uh, we, uh, okay, yes, we are in uh, the adoption of the new uh, work program for GEO. And I would like to know what uh, are uh, foreseen to be the main areas of focus in these uh, regions and uh, how you believe that uh, an, an initiative or a coordination action like a GeoCradle uh, could support uh, this uh, uh, in uh, taking into consideration the specificities of these regions, North Africa, Middle East, and the Balkans, and the Black Sea. I mean, how do you think that uh, the new work program of GEO could be uh, further supported by the activity of GeoCradle in the future? So uh, a couple of my colleagues did a review of the work program and they looked at a number of things like what's the policy driver for each activity, what's the funding, um, what's the level of technology and technical detail, the maturity, and they've done that assessment. I think they've done maybe 15 to 20 activities out of the 70 so far. And I think from my knowledge of GeoCredo is um, maybe filling some of the gaps in areas where... Um, the regional activity is not very strong. So, for example, Arab states. Um, the, there's very little going on with GEO and Arab states, but UNESCO, the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, are really keen to do something to drive support of the SDGs. So that would be one area, um, looking at EO for SDG, um, which is covering indicators 2, 6, um, 9, 11, 13, 14, and 15. So already you've got a lot of stuff just around the SDG support. Then if you look at some of the other specific activities, some of the community activities, you've got the geo, the land degradation neutrality work. So UNCCD, again working on 15.3.1, is going to be very important in that region. So I think it, it depends if you're looking, so if you're looking at food security, and you're looking at water resources management, and you look, it depends if you're looking thematically or if you're looking geographically. But I think there are definitely gaps in, in the Middle East region or, and North Africa um, within GEO in terms of engagement. And then I think there are opportunities to build on things like GeoGlows, uh, the Human Planet Initiative, uh, eo for sdg as I've said, GeoLDN. There's probably five to 10 of those initiatives that are global enough in nature, but you can take locally through GeoCradle. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is uh, for France. Okay, France, yes, I mean, we have uh, recently uh, launched the big EuroGeos uh, initiative, which is going to last four years. Uh, I mean, uh, in uh, EuroGeos, uh, we have uh, um, discussed a lot about the supports of uh, the support and the engagement of the European capacities into the development of EuroGeos. But uh, we do uh, want to, uh, to listen to you. What uh, you believe is EuroGeos is going to uh, provide to the regions towards the development of Earth Observation Services, the development of Earth Observation Sustainable services in the region. Do you see Eurogeos playing a role there? And uh, I mean, what, what is your opinion? What do you, as a representative of the European Commission? <coughs> okay, so, so it's important to notice that the um, Eurogeos initiative, which was launched last year, I think, in Washington, is, is driven not only by the Euro European Union and the European Commission, but by the European Union together with member states. Um, and so the idea is to coordinate, to and combine what is done in the different member states uh, on, on the national level and to, co to extend collaboration, which would also allow initiatives that have been uh, started or have been developed at the national level to scale up at the European level, to, to um, develop their business on a, on a European level and beyond, even on a global level. So to support the coordination uh, and um, collaboration within Europe is, is certainly one important aspect. Eurogeos is a geo initiative, so it corresponds, of course, also to the other regional um, initiatives. While everyone has its own, I think, different sco um, scope and objectives, which is normal because uh, situations are very different in the different continents. And the important thing is Eurogeos as an initiative is not uh, like a funding program like what we are running in, in, in the agency. It's a, and therefore it has more a long-term um, perspective that's, that's, uh, that's important. Mm -hmm. um, while the 
the limitation of projects like GeoCradle is always they, they stop after three or four years and then it's always hard to get the momentum running. And so that's why we s think it's important to have an initiative like EuroGeos which is continuing and which continues encourage, encouraging coordination among the, the governments and the, the people in the states. So then you think that uh, Eurogeos, I mean, uh, as an initiative, I mean, given that uh, we will continue for the next year uh, as a geo-regional initiative, could uh, continue building capacity building, but uh, is it uh, could be linked to the Eurogeos uh, perspective? I mean, do you consider that all our activity in GeoCradle could be linked into uh, around uh, building, uh, let's say, training uh, the regions uh, about Eurogeos and what Eurogeos is going to uh, deliver uh, in the future? I would hope to see that what has been set up with, uh, with GeoCradle uh, in this region can continue and, and will, will continue to be alive uh, as part of, of Eurogeos, if you like, um, afterwards. Of course, there will be the Eurogeos, show, uh, Euro, Eurogeos project probably going on. Um, <clears throat> that we are still evaluating, so it's not certain. <laughs> um, which is then additional, some sort of uh, funding for, uh, for this initiative. But the important thing is also that, you, that what you build up is sustainable in itself. And that uh, capacity building is something hopefully to stay if governments start building up capacity there should be support, and that's why it's also important to link with users, to link uh, with business, to make sure that there's something growing where that, 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 that is there to stay and not only live on the funding, but live, live on the needs and on the business models. Okay, so then you, you see that uh, GeoCradle has a role in the, to what we call um, uh, bringing uh, new stakeholders or, I mean, uh, uh, this is what we call, how we call it, on-board process. I mean, an activity that we are bringing new comers into the Eurogeos initiative. I mean, do you see the Eurocredel as playing that role, bringing uh, regional uh, entities and organizations into this uh, on-board process of Eurogeos? I think uh, Geocradle did a very good, uh, very good job in, in linking these different levels, which are the users, and, uh, and, and that's important to link with the users to identify clearly what are the users in the different sectors, economic sectors, agriculture, other sectors, um, energy, um, like, for example, you, you developed this, this catalog for solar energy for Egypt. This is examples that can be used on the spot which demonstrates to users that there is a use, that they w would be then also continue to engage in one or the other way with the providers, with the people who, uh, who are able to access and develop um, earth observation products for those users. So it's very important to have this link from the beginning to co-design pro pro uh, products with users so there's, there's, uh, there's the need identified and there's also ideally a business model behind, which is at the end of the day nothing else but having an idea how can this be, how can this work on a long term. Okay, thank you very much. You wanted to add uh, something before well, we pass uh, to the question. All, all I was going to say is there's, there's already a massive opportunity with Copernicus per se because it's already in Australia and Africa and Asia and it's changing Earth observations globally like without us even doing anything because of all the work that's been done in the past. So that's a massive opportunity just to, to build on what Copernicus is already doing. So that internationalization of Copernicus offers a huge opportunity for, sure. for, for everyone. Okay, thank you. And uh, Bonica, the following question is for you. I mean, you have been part of the GeoCradle uh, since uh, its beginning. Uh, you have been working in uh, uh, in, in, in capacity building, actually, you are developed. So you have developed. I mean, together with the other colleagues in GeoCradle, uh, a rather prototype methodology for assessing the maturity of uh, the countries yeah. in relation to Earth observation, but also about their knowledge in uh, regard to Geo and Copernicus. Uh, what do you believe are the the best lessons that uh, have been learned out of this activity? And what do you think is good to sustain for the future? I mean, how we continue? 
in the future about all yeah. this. Thank you, Harris. Uh, yes, building on what Franz mentioned is uh, well, the links, uh, what we can uh, take uh, from the, the takeover, from the, the assessment of the capacity of the maturity of the EO, um, uh, of the EO services in the, in the different countries. This is the assessment that it has been put into the Eurogeos proposal for taking these uh, cases further on. So we, we test this methodology and um, for complexity, I, I put two slides because I, I want to show a few indicators. I don't know if I can go along. Well, uh, what, uh, the complexity itself, I feel that is uh, building this, this puzzle, as I mentioned before. Uh, before was connected about the regional part uh, and how the, the sustainability of the regional needs, but this part is really focused on the assessment. So to build this uh, is to know really the, uh, the main elements. We need to ask ourselves why we need that. So knowing the, um, the, the physical mobilization of, of, of resources are one of the main elements why we need this maturity. So once we have the picture, we try to mobilize this, this funding uh, resources. Then we have the, uh, an accurate picture. It's not uh, before. So we need to see what is the status of the country, the status of the region, to see how is today and how we'll move for the future. So this is the, the accurate picture that that this methodology was putting in place uh, to, 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 to elaborate with all the gaps, all the needs, all the demand, and, and, and having this picture for, for the future. So we, we have a path to go. Then the other is about uh, how other programs, like uh, Franz mentioned before, Eurogeos, or maybe if, uh, Steve was mentioned under this very big umbrella, programmatic levels, how we inject this, uh, this uh, assessment into these programs. And then finally, is try to see this, this mapping the, ma the maturity for the country level. So with that, we have a kind of best practice approach. So uh, for doing this methodology, we, we started from the, something that is a methodology, but we tested. So we've been through the different uh, steps here from the definition, going through the collection of the data, trying to better understand all the gaps that the country had, have through the analysis and the, the argumentation. With that, it was a, a lot of effort as, 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 uh, to, to discuss with the different uh, actors and the stakeholders, interviewing them. But we, we really need uh, and consider that to have this picture was essential to develop this maturity. So then the, uh, how to visualize and put uh, that information in a, in, a, in a shape that could be standardized. This is why we define the, the scoring range. And then the, there was the, this visualization of the maturity cars for taking later on the, the replication and scaling. So uh, this is why I wanted to show the, the complexity because we were not looking only about a few indicators. I mean, uh, definitely when you talk about indicators could be anything. But here we focus on these three main pillars, collaboration, capacity, is an uptake, and each of those have been subdivided. So we've been looking into every single indicator, putting a methodology, putting a, a kind of framework uh, from the different levels, level zero to level one, two, and three, four. So, and through all these interviews, through all this gap analysis, we've been able to, to, to put a picture in each of the countries. So to, for a standardization, we, what he presented here is the, the model that we develop in, in the 11 countries in the Balkan, in Balkan, Middle East, and North Africa. But definitely gave us a, a, a visualization step to go and see this is the reality in your country as per the, the data, because the collection of the data has been very challenging. But uh, this is what uh, we've been looking into that, and we have all the samples from the region. So uh, this means that the methodology has been really a, um, supported by the, 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 the partners, but also they were supported by the, all the, 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 the people that we have been interviewing through the governmental level, through the academia, through the research. And it was very nicely to see how the, the people was commenting on the maturity, how they were putting uh, the green light on the, on the, on the, dif and the, on the different ma uh, maturity cars. So there were a few results that uh, we, we wanted to show for uh, in a spider chart. 
regarding the region about the capacities, cooperation and uptake, and you see already very visual uh, insights. So one of the, the one of the, the visual one is that the, the, we take the sample that the countries that have been already uh, designated as space authority showing a little bit more uh, better trends in, in this indicator. So we go for cooperation, we have the same. But uh, also we have here the connection where all the countries have been implicated in activities through, G, uh, through Copernicus or through Geo, they were also high ranking into the into the cooperation and uptake. So, well, the conclusions on EFS steps is that we, we think definitely the, the methodology has been uh, supported and validated uh, with something that was a kind of a, a, a quantitative, semi-quantitative, and, and put some thoughts at the very beginning, but how we've been able to face all the, to, to face all the uh, challenges. Uh, it definitely, we, we identified when interviewing uh, uh, people from the governments that uh, they support the decision making to see the reality of the, of the country into the into the maturity, and then uh, has been uh, again a, a, a complex situation. But and we have limitation into that, and this is why we try to propose the, the takeover for another project. So that this maturity has been put it as a methodology. We know that it's working, uh, and well, probably there, there are a few issues to discuss, like the ben benchmarking, normalization. That for having this data has been a challenge for this project. So we need to expand on those. So these are the, the, the main uh, outcomes of what we see on the, the next steps to, to take this methodology and be able to do this in, the, in, the, in all the different regions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. Actually, I mean, uh, I have to take the opportunity uh, to thank you, of course, and uh, the other partners of the project that uh, you have developed together this prototype methodology. Actually, I know that uh, my colleague uh, Lefteris Mamais has presented in a, recently in a conference, and it is widely accepted. And uh, I do believe that uh, this methodology should uh, continue to be uh, uh, further developed and applied into more countries. Because now, in the geo cradle, of course, we had the opportunity to apply it only in 11 countries out of uh, the. 25, I think, that uh, we had initially engaged into our plans. But uh, anyway, I mean, uh, this is uh, uh, the, what, what GeoCredit is going to do in the future. I mean, as an, as an initiative to continue implementing this methodology in other countries and making uh, even this assessment and uh, enriching this assessment also by bringing more countries um, in. Um, in this uh, assessment study. Uh, anyway, of course, you mentioned something that it is very important because, uh, I mean, what we realized in GeoCradle is that uh, it is uh, not easy to engage uh, stakeholders and countries, countries by just sending a questionnaire, asking things, uh, uh, trying to understand what is their need or what is their priority, etc. But we, we, you have, we had to visit these countries. We had to organize uh, a, a different and several uh, in different countries, several uh, regional workshops, and this at the end, uh, this was what at the end uh, uh, gave some fruits uh, for uh, um, uh, creating um, for producing or for delivering this type of studies. So we do continue this. We know that it is not an easy task. Uh, it's uh, uh, at the same time uh, it uh, requires a lot of effort and. Uh, budget, I may say, but uh, I mean, we do believe that we are going to exploit um, also other frameworks, including Eurogeos, but also uh, other funding uh, instruments so as to be able to continue this activity in the future. Yeah. You, let me, you want let me to comment on the, on the issue because the, the project was uh, three years, and um, um, well, I think 36 months in total. Uh, from, we started this activity of the maturity at the very beginning, and we, we were able to have a draft uh, analysis of the situation by the middle of the project. So where we learn in the, at the end of the project is that the, the network activities were uh, immensely important on, on to, to get this information for countries. And uh, for because they, with this middle term of, uh, of months, they were developing more uh, information, they get awareness. And so when at the very beginning, the cooperation indicators were low. At the very end, they were very high, well, very normal, rationally high. But uh, so the, uh, what is reinforcing that networking events are needed for this uh, for, and capacity building itself is really needed in the in the countries to to make awareness at the end so we we validate that uh, that indicators very properly on that okay mm -hmm. thank you monica thank you very much uh, uh, i wonder if there is any question from uh, the audience yes please
One of the <clears throat> subjects, I'm Jay Perlman, one of the subjects was sustainability in the title of this particular session. And you talked about parachuting in, parachuting out, programs start and then they stop. What's the core direction to really create sustainability in the different regions that we're seeing? And surely it's not the same in Greece as it is in Egypt. But let's talk about the approach and how we're going to get there. Um, I think we have in, in Europe, of course, a quite good situation. Copernicus is an operational program that is there to stay. And uh, Copernicus is also delivering uh, downstream products to some extent, like the Copernicus Climate Change Service, for example, which is right there to, to be used already by on the, on the spot. But, but additionally to this, of course, we need also sustainable business models also for the private sector that can make use of this data, deliver it to, to users, uh, to the economy, for example, to agriculture, to energy, uh, to insurance companies, and, uh, and have a business model that is, that is sustainable. So that's what we have to work on in, in Eurogeos also, to, have, to develop services that can be sold to customers basically, and that's another, that's another strand of, of achieving sustainability, to have customers who are willing to pay for the product. My perspective is that uh, the involvement of the user such as, uh, could be from the, the decision-making side of the commercialization or in other industries need to be done from the very beginning. So they are buying in already the, the, the application of the services, and this will bring the sustainability. So my perception is that really the uptake is, 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 is one of the major factors to, to make sustainable. If you got this buy-in of the services, then you will get the, the sustainability for the, for the product. So, I mean, this whole session is about value. So, sustainability will only come when people understand the value, whether that's the value of training, whether that's the value of... And I, I think, it, yes, it's private sector, but it's also public sector. The public sector have to step up. Countries have to make investments, long-term investments. And so there's, like, probably 15 or 20 of us thinking about this right now for Digital Earth Africa. How do we take... So we've probably raised something like 20, 25 million already, which is huge for Geo. I mean, Geo, Geo operates in the hundreds of thousands. I mean, okay, these guys do 100 billion, but that's, that's Horizon 2020, which is outside of Geo. Um, but, I mean, if we, if we pull this off and we bring in tens of millions of dollars to build an initiative in Geo, this is going to be like a, a, a whole-scale change. And so the, there are many of us thinking about this sustainable model, but it's not there are different phases, and one of the phases is absolutely to bring in the private sector, particularly the small and medium-sized enterprises, to stimulate economic growth. And I mentioned earlier Agenda 2063, and that's all about the socio-economic transformation of Africa. So I, I think it's a balance of getting um, local people the skills and expertise they need over a long period of time, and the, the private sector stuff, but it's also, I mean, and this is what GEO is, we're an intergovernmental organization. So it's getting the countries that are members of GEO and bringing in other countries to help build that sustainability. But none of that will happen without this value discussion and everybody understanding value at different parts. So I think the value chain comes up later on, but different parts of the value chain. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Steve, Monica, Franz, thank you indeed uh, for your valuable comments. I think uh, uh, part of the answer is coming to the next uh, panel discussion, which is uh, moderated by Jeff Sawyer, about how to move from research to, to value, to real value, and to, sustainable, to sustainability, if I may say, of Earth Observation Service. So, uh, Jeff, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you I, want to add something? Yeah, I, ju I just want to say, make sure GeoCradle works with the capacity building working group in Geo, because the two things are like really closely aligned. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So uh, let's, um, with that introduction, let's let's move on to the next uh, next panel. We called this from research to business, but research to sustainability would have been perhaps a better uh, title in this uh, this session. From research to business is a particular priority of mine at the, at the moment to try to. Uh, Overcome some of the barriers, but uh, let's try and broaden out the uh, the context as we're as we're discussing. Um, I just need to load up my next presentation, but um, maybe I could call the panelists to uh, to come forward. So, Franz, you shouldn't have uh, have left. <laughs> Is he gone? <laughs> oh, Alexia. Uh, Nicola and uh, Gerard. Gerard with us? Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, you <cra> <laughs> yeah, I didn't see you come forward. So then we, we, we hear about the importance of developing uh, regional capacity and the value of regional networks in helping to develop that capacity. Um, surely one of the main or a very important driver for that is, is research and development. And uh, so this session is about trying to understand how R&D can help drive and encourage uh, capacity building and uptake in, in regions. So um, imbe embedded in that is the creation of sustainable networks, cr creation and sustaining networks even, um, building capacity and uh, developing products and services which can be exploited from that capacity. So that's the basis for the discussion I wish to, uh, uh, to stimulate. and. One of the perceptions that we have is this, the problem of the barriers to exploiting research. Now here's where I put my representative of the commercial sector hat on. And we find that one of the, uh, a number of barriers exist and I'm hoping that with the panel we can maybe um, investigate these and maybe develop, uh, uh, understand others. So we find that users, um, which are necessary for understanding the, the, the direction of the research and guiding the research and the exploitability of the research. But um, they are becoming used to having uh, the benefits of the research and wait for the next project before committing to, uh, to taking up the research. So from a commercial perspective, there is a, a barrier there. Um, at the end of the project, and we see more and more research-based projects, uh, funding stops leaving a gap before the work can be recommitted. Lack of business engagement during the products leads to um, uh, uh, researchers and innovators looking for support going forward. And because of the uncertain nature, by definition, uh, funding often run out. So what we're looking to do is to try to develop some means to, uh, to support that. Um, so we see the commercialization of EO services from pilot to market, uh, going through uh, a number of uh, recognizable steps. Each one of those steps is requiring a different level of, uh, different type of support, a different um, sustainable uh, intensity of, of, uh, of support. So access to knowledge is important to understand what are the user requirements, what are the, uh, the market technology and the investment uh, trends. Um, to, to, within which the, uh, the work is, uh, is sitting. Access to financial resources to take that uh, research forward into a sustainable uh, um, position, whether it's commercial or whether it's uh, satisfying uh, um, public sector needs or even further research needs. Access to technology, so the, the, the balancing of the technology, the piece that's missing um, to, to take it forward, whether it's uh, um, we heard about big data tools and the way those are, those are helping, whether it's access to, to data from our own sector, whether it's access to data coming from completely different sources. And then the, um, the understanding of the markets in order to make uh, 
make this uh, commercial. So we talk about a, a conveyor belt of taking these um, projects through um, the different stages of development with sustainable support, different levels of intensity. And um, this is the, uh, the approach that we are, we are looking at. So what I would like to explore with our, uh, our eminent uh, panel is the views on this, the process, the ability of uh, R&D to sustain um, activities in the regions and how to take that into uh, commercial uh, application. So I would ask each in turn to make a, a sort of an opening perspective um, around that. Feel free to, to go whatever direction you, you want. Um, so please, Franz, uh, I, I'll, uh, you, you have the experience of being here, so I'll let you start first. Thank you. Um, what, what I saw from your slides, actually an aspect missing that what came to my mind, because I was not prepared with the question, is uh, the aspect of education, mm -hmm. which I think is also extremely important for capacity building, is for this type of of business that we look at, earth observation data, you need highly skilled, highly trained people who are able to, to deal with, to are able to program ex applications, deal with big data, et cetera, et cetera. And um, th so that's an important aspect that, that needs to be looked at. You cannot build capacity without the people who are able to, to run this. And I think our program does contribute to some extent also to this part. In, in, in the end of the day, a lot of the money we we give away uh, goes to PhD students working, uh, working on developing, working in the educational framework, doing a PhD, or uh, at another level. Um, so, so that's at least what we can do so on the research side. On the business side, it's also important um, that we end up with that our projects don't stop uh, at the at the research level. That's one thing that we need to fund, which is important. But we also have what we call innovation actions, which should pick up this knowledge there and bring it to a higher uh, technology readiness level, or however you want to call it, so closer to the market. And there it is important that at the end there's, there's a business model, which means that you, can, that you are able to demonstrate that there is value. And I, um, that was, has been mentioned earlier, you have to be able to demonstrate there's value for customers. So, and that's why the co-design is important. So you have to talk to the customers in the first place to know in the first place where that is, with this would really have value. So if there's value, whether it's in the public domain or in the private domain, I agree, um, then there will be also sustainability because if the value is recognized by people outside the research domain, then there will be sustainability. That's a, okay. a great message, thank you. Uh, Alexia. Um, I have also prepared some slides uh, to show the example of GeoCradle that we have uh, uh, developed and uh, actually some of the factors already mentioned here are factors that also contributed to the success of the exams of GeoCradle because really as Monica uh, presented uh, previously, I think it's important that we started uh, from the user perspective and we really identified the needs uh, that the local, the regional uh, stakeholders had. Um, the Egypt was a good example and uh, I'm happy that we have our uh, Egyptian partner here as well. And uh, I, I, yes, I could show some examples. So as uh, Harris presented, these were the four pilots implemented by uh, Joe Cradle, and uh, of course they're strongly connected with the UN st strategic development goals, and uh, they are applicable and adaptable to all the countries, not only in this region, and uh, we were based in uh, end user needs as uh, Monica analyzed with this uh, unique methodology, and we had a really strong development in uh, engagement of stakeholders. You will see here we have uh, gathered per uh, 
uh, pilot the end users each time that they were deeply involved from the beginning uh, of uh, the design of the pilot themselves, also throughout the implementation. And uh, also another uh, factor that uh, helped is that we offer uh, open and free access to all the pilot results, including data sets and the services themselves, because we also go, we want to go to the services most, not just data. So from the website and the portal of uh, GeoCradle, you go to the GeoCradle Data Hub and uh, you can filter here, you can search and see all the data sets and uh, they're filtering also by publisher. So if you, let's say, interested uh, in climate, you can see the results uh, by pilot and uh, let's go, for example, to DR Clima, which was one of the uh, results of the first pilot, adaptation to climate change. So we provide this application. So in all this uh, selection map area, which includes uh, mostly the Europe and North Africa and Middle East, you can select an area and uh, you can take, uh, for example, this is the temperature in two meters and this goes until uh, 2100. So we have for every area here some uh, important climatic uh, variables and uh, we also provide uh, other kind of data with, uh, for example, this was for Crete and uh, you can see here in all the area, another very important was the dust forecast, for example, from the Sahara, the, the, which has a very big influence both in health, in radiation, in a lot of uh, issues. So a, a whole list of uh, end users were involved in this uh, pilot, the adaptation to climate change. We can see even uh, a private also companies, we can see ministries, so it's from across all the value chain, also research, all these were uh, cooperating in order to make the results of this pilot. Uh, as we pass to the second pilot, for example, improved food security and water extreme management. Again, for all the region of area, we provided uh, some uh, layers and some information which uh, the end users themselves, they told us that they are important. Uh, for example, the soil moisture for the floods in the disaster domain. Uh, we provided uh, here, this is the area of Balkans and we give the 25 year uh, floods hazard. We can also, we were also in touch a lot with agriculture uh, stakeholders and uh, they, they stressed the importance of uh, the soil analysis for the results to have better, uh, better results in their crops management. And uh, so we provided in all, uh, we took samples from a lot of countries, 11 countries, and uh, we give and we offer for download also not only the visualization, we also offer free download for the spectrum and the chemical results of each of the uh, soil samples. You see here, the, again, the data hub, the regional data hub of GeoCradle and all the countries. So it's in all this area, which is marked in blue on the left, you can have this information. Uh, for example, what was important for this uh, uh, SME, for example, Golan Heights Winery told us that they use this and it's actually earth observation based so that they improve their crops and they know exactly the soil uh, properties every time. So they adjust their irrigation based on the, on the findings of this uh, analysis. And uh, in the third pilot, uh, access to raw materials. Also, we published online through the Eurogeo Surveys portal. We published all the work we have done. Here, for example, you can see with uh, five different techniques, the liniment map extracted. This was applied in uh, three countries. And again, here, uh, we had um, an, um, a company, Hellenic Copper Mines LTD, which also in cooperation with the ministry, they told us that uh, this is useful for their work on environmental monitoring after the closure of the mines. And uh, here are more uh, stakeholders. Here we had also an effort in uh, Morocco and Algeria, which was, uh, we had some challenges there and we had some difficulties. We, it's a part also of this session to mention about this. Um, and uh, we took a lot of capacity building efforts there and we established the connection. We didn't have a pilot itself finally there, but we, we did a lot of work to, to pave the way. <laughs> and uh, the last pilot, access to solar energy, this was also very successful because, uh, for example, for Egypt, the, the government of Egypt themselves, they say that it's their strategic goal to invest in solar energy. So 
Uh, we cooperated with them. We had a local partner there. We made a lot of activities and uh, regional workshops and meetings. And we provided for all Egypt the solar atlas, which is very important uh, for the photovoltaic installations and the solar plants. The same we did for Greece. And also we provided more, uh, more info for Greece, for example, for this uh, Crete island, uh, which is based on input from the camps. So Copernicus is very important because, of course, it's sustainable itself. And uh, we gave her for three more countries, Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt, the PAR, which quantifies the energy that supports photosynthesis. It's also very important for energy potential. And here you can see the, the end users and the key stakeholders. You can see the Ministry of Egypt, for example, and you can see also a Heart Foundation. This is Bakdi Yacoub, who, is, who wanted to make an installation green, so they wanted to be based on solar energy, and they used the results of our pilot. So thank you. This is the website. So in, uh, to sum up, uh, I think that it's important that both uh, the end user involvement from the beginning of the session, from the beginning of all the process, and you co-design together with them the needs and exactly what technical requirements they have. But uh, there are also challenges because uh, in some countries, especially in North Africa, we had uh, an issue that, uh, okay, they want more capacity building, but uh, they also had uh, some um, let's say challenges and uh, uh, obstacles because of the infrastructure them itself. For example, they were telling that they don't have a good internet connection to download all this kind of uh, data. It was a common uh, complaint, let's say, that we had during the, our uh, events there. And uh, another issue that was mentioned once was that in, uh, for example, when we were cooperating and we were discussing with professors of universities, they were telling that they have good scientists, but some scientists also, after a lot of training, then they finally go abroad and they lose, you know, brain drain. They also lose them from their countries themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexia. I think you answered some of the questions that I was, was, was going to ask in a, in a, in a minute. So that's, that, that's good. I'll think of some new ones. So we've heard from the, if I said the funding um, body. We've heard from a university perspective. Nicola, can I ask you, you come from a research institute. I give your perspective on this. Yeah, thank you. Good morning to everyone. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, we go from research to business. That's a huge question, and uh, I'm clearly uh, trying to better understand what is the successful path, mm. how to go there. Now, there are a number of issues and also limitation that is uh, in the system. That uh, So first of all, we need to go from, uh, we've been discussing a lot in, in Era Planet, uh, the program I coordinate, we discuss a lot how to go from data discovery to knowledge. So you have a lot of data that can be satellite in situ, socioeconomic data, how you put all this data together, how you develop user-driven tools, so specific tools that can allow you to interpret data, observational data, to better understand the, the, the specific issues and how you can solve it. So what are the critical indicators that you can use? Uh, when you deal with the, in Era Planet we have a, a four project. One is uh, for urban area primarily. Another one is, uh, that is MURPS and uh, coordinated by Evangelos. And uh, this deals primarily with the issues of urban scale, so air quality, um, waste, 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 uh, waste uh, uh, management, and uh, immigration, so water demand, so all the typical issues that you have in every urban area, especially crowded urban areas. So the challenge is how can I develop a tool that can assist manager, city manager, for example, to find the most suitable solution to face this problem. So this means a lot of interaction and also acceptability of what you do. That is one of the sometimes research 
the limiting factor for research is uh, when you try to have a dialogue with the policymaker, that means uh, regional agency or regional ministries and so forth, and also stakeholders, and uh, how are you sure that they will be listening to you when you propose a, a scheme or tool that can help them for solving issues like air quality, for example, how you can manage uh, urban traffic flows or, or mobility at urban scale in order to match the requirement of an air quality directive, for example. Many countries, in a, many cities in a Europe are, are not respecting the air quality limits because most of the issues are related to uh, mobility, uh, private and commercial mobility of goods in the urban area. But not only that, you know, there are other issues that, uh, so there are, uh, when you go to a larger scale, so still as acceptability of a research outcome, you get a, a much more complexity. For example, another project that I am personally engaged with is the IGOSP project as part of Era Planet that, that deals with the, uh, mercury pollution and uh, how to support the Minamata Convention to achieve its goal. Now, here is we developed a lot of a nice, beautiful application and uh, also designing uh, user-driven application to help uh, nations how to control emission and how you can match your uh, that with the target of the, of the convention. Now, the convention has not yet fixed the target because it's still at the beginning of the implementation. In one month's time, we will have the conference of party, the number two. So it's still at the beginning to fix what are the target, what... Uh, in, so uh, as part of this, uh, as Era Planet and personally, we are part of the eff uh, effectiveness evaluation of the convention, ad hoc group, so to fix criteria to fix the key indicators that you will use in the code design of your user-driven uh, application to, to, uh, to show different scenario that uh, policymakers should be aware of and should consider in the cost-benefit analysis to find the best solution how to lower the impact of this contaminant on human health and ecosystem. So this has an impact on uh, national policy of industrial development because you can may find out that if you switch off a, a certain industrial sector will have a certain cost and you can have a benefit on, on other industrial sector and so on. So that is, so now the limiting factor for research is the acceptability of a public domain in listening you to interact with you and to <coughs> to use uh, your knowledge that you will make available through, uh, you know, uh, user-driven tools, not very sophisticated, because otherwise you, you will have a, a problem of usability. So what the friends was saying to develop uh, a capacity building program that can interact at different uh, level of society involving public administration, private sector, and the private sector can help a lot in this capacity building because it is a, it's a very complicated job. And uh, very often scientists are not very good in the transferring of knowledge and the capacity building programs. You know, we are not very much keen to, and we don't have the right language very, very often. So we, we, we have difficulties to, to explain why two plus two is four and not five. It's not easy, you know, sometimes, because you talk with the people with a different background. So I think the effort we have, put to, we have to put in place in the next few years in order to reinforce the European community capacity to transfer this knowledge that is gained through research to the, to the uh, let's say, to end user with the help of the public, of the private sector, that the, I would change a little bit the, the, the way to say it. Private sector can help a lot research to transfer knowledge and to make this knowledge accessible to, uh, from the public domain and, 
in order to advance, in order to make sure that this, uh, the outcome of research is really useful, is not just left in the books, research articles and the computers, but is, uh, can see the light and can, people can see the benefit of this uh, taxpayer in, uh, money that have been invested in research that soon or later, hopefully soon, will give uh, something uh, back uh, to improve the quality of life and to allow public uh, administration in Europe and elsewhere to take advantage of this uh, improvement of this progress in research. I don't know. Uh, you open up two very nice uh, um, paths there for, for developing further. Um, the second one, as I see, is how do you, how do you construct the value in, in that, which is, is what we're trying to address within the workshop. And of course, the first one is the, the role of industry in that, in that process. And that's a perfect introduction for, for Gerard to give his perspective on the, uh, on the topic. So um, according to our experience and also to the knowledge we've gathered through different projects, uh, we, we recognize that in order to make this sustainable, we need to go to what we understand for economy of scale. Economy of scale understood uh, as a balance between the cost of the services that we are developing and also the final uh, number of customers that can make uh, use of these services. So the key issue for us is not uh, selling data. So this is uh, another history. So the, the, the clear uh, goal for the industry is to sell services um, beyond that with some. So the further analysis of the, of the data, of the information, and also customized to, customized to, the, to the different users. And also this links with what Franz uh, is saying about the education. Also from the in industry point of view, right now, at least in our case, we are lacking a, a, a number of uh, properly educated uh, uh, trainees or just graduated uh, 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 schools from the university in order to support us in our activities. So for us right now it's very challenging to find the proper people to work with us. Uh, and I guess that the, there is a lack of a proper education line uh, at the governmental level at different uh, European countries, not only European, but uh, I guess worldwide, in order to, uh, to make this affordable. And when we are trying to reach other markets, for instance Africa or Asia, according to our experience, the same problem, the same problem is there. So also the local uh, SMEs that we are going to engage with, they are also lacking uh, lack of resources. One of the uh, topics that we are trying to enforce is that when we are developing the services, we are inherently adding this capacity building that is understood like an engine that uh, nationally can enlarge this educational change in how the, the countries are, are conceiving the specific strategic lines in the educational system. Because if there is an industry behind that is pushing forward to a specific uh, topic, we understand that the government should focus or should follow this, uh, this, this topic. And also we have a, a good, good experience in, in, in Japan, actually, because we have uh, customers here in, in, in Japan uh, where this uh, strategy of economy of scale and also this uh, path from research to business uh, has been successful. And, and the main uh, success points we consider for this uh, result was to apply this economy of scale, so very low prices in the final services, like working in a, in a kind of a subscription fee uh, with different packages. But this implies a lot of efforts at our side in order to customize the final, the, the final uh, results. So in summary, uh, in order to make this path from research to business, uh, we need support from different point of views on, on one side uh, governmental because the knowledge transfer is not normally easy from the university to, uh, to the industry and also this should be ruled in some way because uh, in Europe, uh, at least in Spain, <laughs> the, the things are not easy in, in, the, in, in order to transfer the technology from the university to, to the industry. Uh, everyone shall have a clear idea about their roles, so in, the university doing research industry is doing more or less the operationalization is scaling up. And also this educational uh, lineup in order to align all together. So I guess this is a strategy at national level. So merging uh, education uh, and industry towards a specific uh, research topic, uh, uh, topic lines. 
Thank you very much. Um, and it was it was fantastic. You've just gone, gone full circle and uh, yeah. we're interested back to uh, to France. France, before I, I invite questions, is do you want to make any uh, any comment regarding the the, um, the, the the messages that others have have delivered? Because it, it, it came back again, reinforcing your your initial message. Um, yes, which is thank you for, <laughs> for reinforcing this message. Um, what I think a, a message we can also c convey to businesses that there is a huge resource out there already with with the data open through Geo through Copernicus, huge amounts of data accessible in theory at least if you have the right tools to everybody, which is a huge resource that business can use to develop uh, products that they can sell. So that's probably one message we should also try to convey to the business sector. There's a resource there, data is the gold of the, or the oil of the 21st century, and it's right there to be used. So I, I agree on that. So it, it is true that Copernicus uh, and Sentinel is a game changer in this, in, in this field. But it, it's incredible, but maybe the problem is not data, but also the lack of proper trained uh, human resources in order to exploit all this data because as you know the larger the data you have the more complex uh, processing is uh, and also you need to move uh, through automating uh, most of the chains and also this needs from uh, a skilled knowledge and also the knowledge is changing uh, every day almost so right in the in the past we were discussing about uh, automating like now is big data machine learning in the future we will see what will what, what will be but also the, the education uh, line is is clearly important and also for us the, the issue of the of the Copernicus open free data is a, a game changer but curiously the success stories we have uh, they are not dealing with high resolution but with very high resolution data so also the the user is aware of the needs of very high resolution and also has enough budget, at least in our experience, to afford this very high resolution uh, data. But this is just curiosity for our particular case. But for sure that open data is a game changer. Yeah, I was going to throw it open. Uh, where the time is a little, little, little short. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is Omar El Badawi from Egypt, from Sidari. Uh, I am also partner in uh, GeoCradle uh, project. Uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Alexia and uh, Harris, Harris for uh, this opportunity and bring uh, on the success of the uh, pilot uh, project of Egypt. Uh, and I want to uh, emphasize that uh, the needs, uh, the user needs was a key uh, uh, stone in the success of uh, a case of uh, Egypt. Because the government of Egypt was uh, asking uh, uh, for uh, this product for Solar Atlas. And uh, we are very happy to, uh, to have this product, the first Solar Atlas of Egypt. And this is now is the official uh, atlas uh, in Egypt uh, and used by the government and it's also used by business uh, in business uh, such as uh, Sir Magdi Yaqub uh, used this the data in the solar atlas to build uh, a new uh, hospital uh, in Aswan in uh, the south of Egypt and uh, w and this is, was a success uh, for this project and we are very happy to be there also we started we just we have just started a new project uh, also uh, in, with the African Union uh, in, under the project is GEMS and Africa uh, for uh, developing uh, an uh, Earth observation application uh, for uh, the uh, monitoring and assessment of uh, coastal uh, ecosystems in North Africa uh, with partners from Mauritania, uh, Morocco, uh, Tunisia, uh, and uh, uh, Egypt, of course, uh, and we are uh, uh, we have just started this project, and we will uh, aiming to uh, provide service service provide for uh, uh, oceanography physical oceanography conditions, uh, biological uh, uh, oceanography uh, habitat, and uh, hazards uh, situation in coastal and marine. 
uh, so uh, we are also uh, build on the, the knowledge gains from the uh, GeoCradle project. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I'll, you're talking about the, the success of, of a, of a, of a project-based uh, approach. So clearly there are some really good examples that, that come out. But one of the other messages that we've been picking up uh, more recently is the the counter to that, the, pro the, the problem of the end of a project causing um, a big gap between you know, continuity of the research or continuity of the, the network as we see with, uh, as we've seen with GeoCradle. So maybe I could just ask for some, uh, some, some comments about this, um, uh, this progression uh, from a project-based approach, how you overcome the, the, the problems at the end of the project of ensuring continuity. Well, we are not at yet at the end, we are still <laughs> three years ago. But uh, one thing I'd like to point out to the, this round table was uh, that sometimes research can be also much more advanced than uh, the policy. For example, what we are experiencing now for the Minamata Convention on Mercury, that uh, we'll have the COP2 next month and they have not fixed yet target or indicators or anything like this. And the, the project that uh, we have now, including the flagship on Mercury, is really supporting them to guide them. What could be the key indicators that they can fix in, the, in order to match the target? What are the critical issues? Because, you know, when you get a treaty, there are general principles, general things, but they don't, they, they, you don't find specified what are the goals. There is a general goal to reduce the impact of this contaminant on human health and ecosystem. That's it, but not, nothing more. So from, to go from there to the specific implementation plan at the national level, research project can really help policymakers to better define the policy and also to define as, as such also the strategy, how to reach that. So we have to consider also this. Our research can really help at the early stage of policy development, the policymaker and the, all national authorities to take a decision in which direction to go. Now, the second question you did, uh, how we do when a project is done, uh, how, how we, we can continue, how we can ensure that, that uh, the work that we have done is not lost. That is uh, always has been a big, big issue for the research community because uh, really the continuation, continuity of the activity. And that comes into play what we already said, capacity building, transfer of knowledge from research center, uh, university, to the public sector, because when you do this, this can help also to generate uh, national pro project or even a larger scale project for the application of the tools that uh, you have developed in your project. But that is really a very difficult task, because if your tools are not mature enough, of course there is no interest for national authorities to support your further development. And in this, I think the private sector can help a lot because if the private sector can see a potential use of what you have in your hand, I think they are very good in helping you out to do fundraising to further develop the tools in order to make this commercial yeah. and uh, marketable. Yeah. And, uh, so that's, that's, it's a really a big challenge. And uh, I hope now that in the future, in the framework of uh, a Eurogeos, at least for uh, European people, this will be the right way to go in order to better cooperate to make sure that the private sector and the research sector through the co-design with the stakeholders and policymakers can really have uh, a second phase of uh, development that goes, uh, is an intermediate phase from research to marketable tools. So you have a, a transition phase that requires a co-design with all the major player involved. That's, uh, 
Yeah, thank thank you. And um, again, I think the I think you put your your finger on it in terms of the uh, of seeing the value in in the research and the communication and the co-design uh, process. Um, Root, you uh, were looking to ask a question. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Rutrim from uh, the Netherlands Space Office. Um, yeah, Earth observation is, of course, already existing maybe for 30, 40 years now. And, of course, it started, uh, let's say, from ambitions from national governments uh, and national space agencies to develop a space infrastructure and uh, Earth observation instruments. And, of course, now it's been taken up by uh, and passed by research, and now we are, in fact, looking to, to make really uh, Earth observation a valuable asset in a, a commercial market. And, and what I see is that we're still struggling with that. Um, so the question is maybe also, is Earth, Earth, Earth observation as itself really, a, a, let's say, a commercial market? Eh? So what is the role for the, uh, the business enterprises over here? If I look uh, to the, yeah, uh, the business enterprises in the Netherlands, but also in Europe, uh, what I see is that um, a lot of them came from research. And what I lack with them is they are not entrepreneurs. Hmm. So we can say we should engage with business enterprises, but these business enterprises still act like they are researchers because they go from one project to another project. And this will not change, I think, uh, the business activities uh, as, as being done uh, yeah, we, we are continuing like this. So, but there might be, um, let's say, some positive uh, effects. New people come in, but well, that's what we see in the Netherlands, but we see also in, uh, in other countries where a lot of venture capital is now being put in in United States companies. So they raise uh, millions of uh, dollars and they really start work. But they don't have minimum viable projects yet, but what they do is, is they, they give a, a real big push and uh, they try to develop a market from really a business entrepreneurial perspective. So if you can bring in this type of entrepreneurs and engage them with, let's say, the existing business enterprises that we have in Europe uh, and, and elsewhere and engage with them with resources, that might change things because what we lack in our uh, business activities right now are the skills to develop really a market. And that means that you need to have different skills. You were speaking about education. It's not education in the sense of uh, doing, uh, working with the data. No, it's working in a different attitude. Understand what is, in effect, your customer. What are, the, uh, what are their needs? So you need business and social enterprises to understand. And that is a little bit what and I think in our industry is lacking. So, so that, that is, I think, a, a one major comment on that, the lack of entrepreneurship. And the second thing is, is what is also maybe confusing uh, in developing the market are the roles of the different group. Then we have the commission, we have national space agencies, we have research organizations, and we have the businesses. But what is the message let's say, from when, um, for instance, um, uh, the European Commission is developing all kinds of services and delivering them for free. Uh, a research project is delivering a service and provide that for free for a certain period. But if you are an entrepreneur and you want to develop a market and you go to a customer and you say, okay, I want to have a product on air quality, and then somebody says, but the commission has already an air quality product. So, and the, the customer does not understand the difference between the service that is delivered by a company or by a commission or a research project. So he starts to get confused. What happens then? Nothing. So there is also uh, a, a problem in our uh, community because of the different roles and <laughs> mandates that we do and act as, as from the different institutions. So I don't know I have the solution to that, but I think we have to look into this problem as well. What is the message that we send out when we all deliver services that are free? Okay, then the customer will not, let's say, engage with business enterprises because, yeah, right, that's, that's the second uh, yeah. problem that I see. 
Thanks, Rudolf. I, I would like to. Yeah, it's defi see. definitely a problem that we've been seeing and uh, you know, hearing back from uh, from industry as well. Yeah. I think um, I think I'm going to have to cut it there. Um, I'm sorry, Nicola. Um, we have uh, we're overrunning the there are other side events um, running as well, and we're asked to try to synchronise as best we can. So, so you have a 10-minute coffee break, and then we uh, we restart here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. I didn't, I didn't even see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, why is that summing up that it's in use? Okay. This one? Uh, maybe. No. Yeah. Oh. No. No. No, just the USB drive, like in general. The yeah. And then communicating okay. value, it's a PDF somewhere. It's just called this is PDF? It's PDF? just communication, communicating something. I can see it. Uh, yeah, the top. Okay. Okay. Can I just open it up and see if so. it's going to be big enough? The, the text. How do you do this? This is a full screen thing. Ah, oh, if you have a PDF, I don't know. Yeah, um, view maybe? Ah, here, full screen. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. It's okay? Yes. Okay, <laughs> let me see. Review. A lot of parallel side events in the same time. It was so difficult to find the speakers. Everybody was to it, was spread out, and then the live streaming. We just got the links today, so yeah. I've been back there trying to say, okay, you know, join this event now. People, you know, they're sleeping in most parts of the world. Yes, right yes, now, yes, 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 yes. Just like two or three people watching. Yes, it's, it's uh, very difficult.
questions already. So if, I, if I project this, it's on, it's, it goes on screen. So everybody's... So I have to read that. So we are preparing it. Yeah. yeah you, well, you, you give your perspective. I mean, that's, that's the, uh, the scope of what we're, yeah, we're I mean, talking I'm, about. But I don't know if all, we've talked about it all already. So uh, I, don't, you don't need to, I shouldn't show that one. Uh, and that one is questions if you wish. But, uh, so how can I have it? You can't. Ah. Well, I don't, I don't know if you can. So, okay. Um, what I did was just simply got it. I jotted it down. Well, I don't think I'm going to get it. I think that's No, no, no. Well, you see we've got 45 minutes. Okay. So we're, we're now 50 minutes. So I need to do a short presentation just kind of update you on what we've been doing. So if I finish the half hour, what's coming up? You should do it. Um, so I start on that. Or can I just hang on to yeah, this just so I've got the title and sessions which are measuring the value of it? Got my notes on the back of the table. No, no, I'll go, I'll go to your back. Are we ready to start again? Oh, you've. What's this? Anarchy? <laughs> Log- logistics 101. Okay, we'll, we'll start again. Hopefully some more people will come back in to join us. So this session is about um, measuring the value of Earth observations. There's also... Um, there's, a, there's a slightly longer title on the, um, the handout which says um, measuring value in Earth observations data and communicating it to stakeholders. So... I, I want to just make sure that longer title is recognized because that's an important part of it. Um, so we've already talked quite a lot about, well, we've introduced the, 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 the topics of value. And we've talked about measuring. We've talked about impact and sustainability. So you don't really want to hear too much from me. So what I'll do is, um, Mary, I'm actually going to leave you last. So maybe we'll start with you, Jay, and we'll just work our way through. Um, that you have slides from here. So if you want to come and pick up your slides, that would be...
see, we want to make this small and somewhere in there. Yep, that'll do. Thank you very much, Steve. I have many slides, but I'm going to talk only for just a few minutes with the invitation to uh, extend that as you choose. I want to also recognize my co-conspirators, uh, Caroline Cusack and Adam Ledbetter at uh, the Marine Institute in Ireland, and many of you know Francoise, who's uh, sitting in the audience. So with that, I want to talk about the questions that were raised, and I'm going to use the context of a particular application for oceans to, to go through the discussion points that were raised. But I'd like to give you just a personal opinion before we uh, dive into this. Um, my question has always been um, Earth observation. How do you make it visible? And when I was trying to work on brokering, the definition of an information broker, GeoDAB is a good example, was uh, it's never visible until it fails. And so how was I going to advertise it? And Intel did a very good job saying Intel inside some years ago. But this is an issue that Earth observation has. Only when it's lacking do people complain. And there was a, a senator in the United States, uh, not our current president, who said, why do I need all of these satellites observing weather when I can just get it on the television. <laughs> this is our fundamental problem. So with that, let me talk about some of the perspectives of, of how things go. This was the workshop that Jeff talked about last year, one that I thought was very productive. I'm going to focus on one of the themes, the harmful algal blooms, which are a major issue in the coastal communities. And we had um, the uh, question of uh, how do we go through the product, the value chain, basically. And I won't go through that, but I did want to emphasize as you go through these various things, uh, a common set of information can permeate many, many applications. And we need to therefore not say we have a value chain for an application, but what we have is a value chain to address societal issues, and it's the societal issues, starting from the user and working back. That's the emphasis. And in this one, one of the ones for uh, the toxic blooms happened to be aquaculture, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So what we have are issues. They're very real issues. As you begin to grow um, fish in cages, they can't escape from the issues that are around them and harmful algal blooms, a toxicity from those is an issue that normally they just run away from, they can't. And so this clogging of gills and caged fish, and I can go through the other things, but there's some really fundamental issues that we, as we're going to um, food sustainability and other things, uh, are having to address. What's the impact of that? In the Europe, it's 80 million euros a year. In Japan, it's a billion euros a year. It's a lot of money. And 50% of our salmon comes from caged aquaculture now. So every time you have a piece of salmon, think about it. The, in Ireland, which is the group I'm working with, in the southwest part of Ireland where the, the aquaculture is, it's a half a billion euros a year. So impacts are very significant. And uh, what has been developed is in aquaculture um, for a harmful algal boom, a weekly forecast, and this is used by a large group of people. And they do that by taking satellite data and in situ data, bringing it together, and then mixing that into models and then actually making a forecast. And in the case of the Copernicus data, it's the sea surface temperature and it's the ocean color that's being used. And these are important. Then they use the Navy to bring in situ and some of the buoys out there to produce a um, what you call an integrated product, but that still doesn't work. You can't automate it. And so they have the human interpretation, the experts, then to eventually issue this each week. And this is a very, very interesting process. I won't take any more time on it, but 
I'd be happy to talk about it later. And this is the actual flow, and I just wanted to point out that weather and buoy data is one that's the second one down, if you can't see it, and then satellite data, and eventually leading to the HAB bulletin. Okay, and I'm not going to go through it, but this is what the, the bulletin looks like. These are the predictions. This is actually what's shown to the growing community, which is what's happening to various types of, of plankton on the left, and then what's traditional in terms of historical data. And these are the customers that are involved with that. So I asked my, my colleague, I asked Caroline, who's very, very good in this, I said, is this got some sort of sustainability to it? Because the projects are done, Atlantis is almost done, et cetera. And she said, well, you know, the harvesters and the growers like this so much that they went to the government and they said, we want you to continue this. And so it's being sustained by the Irish government because industry was demanding it. And I think there's a message in that. This was a true engagement of not only the technical side, but the user side. And, and when to bring them together was the question. So uh, I just wanted to leave that. I won't go through this. This is how to essentially move forward. Do you want to comment on the continuation of sustainability of the workshop? Francois uh, set up with the Earth Science Information Partners a series of lectures, which has gone on very, very well. And then finally, we have the book that came out recently on geo value, and that's the socioeconomic value of geospatial information. And so there's a lot of nice things going on, and I just wanted to use the use case to emphasize how we can make that move forward in a sustainable way. Thank you. Great. That was a uh, whiz bang. I like that. Um, I also like the fact that you brought in that that whole stakeholder part, the stakeholders come to government. That I think we might actually write that up as a case study, as a blog post or something for the for the geo community. So, Jono. Hey, everybody. Am I on? Yep. Jonathan Russ from the Australian government. I'm going to give you uh, no slides. I'm just going to give you some lessons that we've learnt uh, as a government agency trying to ensure ongoing uh, public sector investment into Earth observation programs. Uh, in terms of our agency, we're Geoscience Australia. The closest equivalent is probably the USGS. We have a very similar range of functions as the USGS. Um, and we've been quite fortunate to have long-term bipartisan government support for our work in Earth observation and open science for a long time. And, and that support's come, to be frank, even if at the political level they don't understand in detail exactly uh, what we do but they do have confidence that it positively impacts the economy and that investing in our work ultimately pays off in terms of economic growth and tax revenue to the government, that we're not just a cost centre, we're actually, uh, through many, many uh, links in the value chain, helping to support increased tax revenue. But that being said, uh, securing additional funding for transformational projects in a tightening fiscal environment relies more on just general goodwill from, from the government. Um, it requires convincing them that uh, they need to spend more and, and when they've got every department, every agency, the private sector, everybody uh, in their ear, uh, that requires more than a good scientific argument. And we've been quite fortunate to secure substantial new funding for our Digital Earth Australia program this year. And I think that uh, Jay made a really important point there that recruiting those outside the community to lobby and support what you're doing is critical. Uh, at an agency level, not just our EO work, one of our four key pillars is supportive stakeholders. The voices from outside the community uh, are obviously essential. They're not selling anything. When they talk about the value that something has, it's value to them. Uh, it's not value, uh, value to us in terms of more resources to do more cool projects. And, and their stories do have more impact than our stories do. Uh, particularly picking up on, uh, on a point I think our colleague from the Netherlands raised, particularly when we're talking about uh, what the public sector should do versus the private sector. It's important that industry uh, are comfortable telling the government that what a, a public sector organisation is seeking to do is on the right side of the line, that it is not uh, crowding out the private sector, um, that it is something that the industry is comfortable with the government doing. Another key point I think Jay raised uh, is one we've put quite a bit of effort into, which is how do we highlight what will go away if we stop doing what we're doing. 
Um, and I, I think it started in the US, but uh, we kind of, the, the day without space um, idea. I can't remember if it was Noah or somebody who did it and said, um, here's what actually happens if all this disappears. And that can be quite a powerful uh, argument. Of course, that, that's more about what you've already got that you'll lose out on. It doesn't so much cover the what you could have by investing in it further, but it's a very important uh, angle as well. In terms of the value chain approach, we've found it quite useful as a communication tool in highlighting the depended dependencies and linkages that are not always apparent, the hidden, what's hidden behind the scenes of something that people might be familiar with. Uh, we have had some attempts in the past to use it in a more quantitative way. It's actually quite hard uh, in our experience in uh, a knowledge domain to quantify what value added uh, at each stage by particular interventions is. So for example, one of the things we do is uh, pre-competitive geological studies. So we, we, we look at what the, the regional geology is. The private sector then look at that and use that to de-risk decisions about particular areas to go and invest uh, in exploring. 20 years down the track, there might be a major mineral province uh, that is developed. There are a lot of other decisions that come into that. Um, so the science is a necessary enabler. It's clear in the value chain where it fits in, but, but uh, mapping a dollar invested in the, uh, the upstream work to the, the, the jobs and dollars from a major uh, uh, economic project downstream is much harder. So I think we have to be careful not to overreach in how we use value chain analysis. It can be very tempting to, uh, to try and uh, quantify things that are, that are much more complex than that, especially when you're under pressure from people who like those numbers. And, and in our case, that's the, uh, the, uh, the accountants in the finance department who say, yes, yes, it all sounds good in theory, but how many dollars and how many jobs exactly uh, will result from you providing this bit of data into this very complicated um, picture. In terms of economic impact studies, uh, they're important and they're necessary. Uh, in our experience, they are viewed very skeptically by political and business leaders, particularly those who've had anything to do with economics, because um, most economists uh, uh, you know, they will, they will uh, explain to you that it all depends on what the assumptions are uh, that are made, and they're generally determined by who commissions the study. And, and if the people commissioning it are the ones who will benefit uh, from the results of that, then, of course, people aren't stupid, and they can see through that. So, again, it's very important not to try and overreach, particularly where you get uh, text like, for every dollar invested in this, it will create 50 jobs. No one's going to believe that when taken to its logical conclusion, which was, you know, if we spent all the money, then we'd end up with 50 times as much money. It doesn't make any sense uh, if it's taken to the extreme. Uh, la last point is, we talk about adding value by informing decisions. Uh, again, any real decision in the real world has multiple inputs and happens in a political and social context. And we need to ensure we don't always think of ourselves as, as a standalone product or a standalone input to that. Um, EO has a unique value. It is special, but it's not that special. And I say that as an EO person. We, we must make sure that we don't uh, oversell ourselves and pretend that we are you know, a standalone force in the world of decision making. We are an important uh, part of a bigger picture. And the example that we we sometimes use is GNSS is a technology necessary for Uber, but it's not sufficient. You didn't get Uber just because of GNSS. And we've got to look at it the same with, with EO, is how does EO plug into other communities and how can, they, how can we make sure they take advantage of it and integrate it with other things? And never underestimate the power of a pretty picture to a politician. Uh, they, they love an animation or a pretty picture. Sorry, I'm done. That was, that was my uh, the thoughts according to Jono. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, you have slides you want to use, or you just go and talk? Uh, is this on? It's a big, massive microphone. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> I feel sort of uh, taken back 50 years sitting behind this. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I do have some slides, Steve, but I'm not going to use them. So okay. there, there are some slides that will be distributed later, but uh, I think I'll just talk, and I've got some... Uh, some supporting material that I can uh, I can wave around. So, so maybe just reintroduce yourself. There's a few new faces. Okay. So I'm Jeff Sawyer, uh, Secretary General of, of ERSC. 
we, we, we know each other. Uh, <laughs> so um, I want to pick up, I, I mean, the, that, uh, the case you, uh, you elucidate there, Jay, is, uh, is a really nice one. I, I, I really like it, um, with the, the multiplicity of stakeholders and the, the messages that that, uh, that, that brings. Um, we've been working on this value chain approach for some years now. It, it all started because um, I th we found the politicians are susceptible to these big macro uh, analyses. And uh, as I always say, you know, thank goodness they were. Um, but I w I'm glad they bought the arguments, but I wouldn't have bought them. Um, you know, these big top-down, uh, ma making very simplistic assumptions and uh, big macro. And uh, um, so we, we started from the opposite end and looked at product-based value chains. So we start with a product and trace its impact through right down to its impact on society and the various stakeholders and the people within society. Um, and we've been working on a, a number of cases uh, like this that I'll talk about in a moment. And I think the two approaches are very complementary. We do need the macro analysis. Um, you know, we, can, we, can, we can joke about it, but uh, it is the language of economists. It is the language of politicians, and they do like large numbers. Um, but um, uh, when it comes down to, uh, as an engineer, I like to see something which is grounded much more uh, solidly. And so we take uh, this, this approach of looking at uh, individual products and seeing what value is created by them and then saying, well, but there are an awful lot of products out there. And we started this and um, the, the key to it, it really is understanding the, the value chain and understanding who's impacted by whatever the process is that's, that's going on. And that's, that's not always obvious, but what it provides is some really great insights into where the uh, where the benefits are falling, and as as you said so neatly, uh, Jono, the um, you know the value is not um, the value to that user. He only perceives that value to himself. But what we're looking at is the greater value and the value to, to society. And I think that's um, a very um, valid and important role, and a, perhaps the critical element of what we're trying to uh, trying to do. And the third. Point, and this one came up really strongly in uh, the, the workshop I mentioned earlier in Washington last year. Um, the, it was, I think, the second or maybe the third GeoValue workshop. Um, is its importance as a communication tool? You know, the the that the technology that we represent, and absolutely right, it's not the technology; it's a technology amongst many others. Um, we believe it has many attributes and very positive attributes, but others would contend that, and so we're we're fighting in that uh, in that jungle. And these value chain analyses are, are really really important as a as a communication tool. Um, and we've we're, we're 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 playing with that at the moment, and uh, it's why I particularly wanted a communication uh, perspective on on the, on this panel because um, how to communicate the results is so important. I can, I can give you, um, firstly, just looking at the, at, at the value chain, we have this representation from the first three, three studies we, we have. So you can see a progression down the page, different players in the value chain, a very linear value chain. But value chains are not always linear. Um, there are often um, recursive elements and, and different players who are coming at different, different points. So this is a very simplistic, easy to understand, but it's also uh, not always accurate. But we've, in the, the first three studies we do, we, we, we represented each value chain in, in, in that way. And so uh, the first three studies are on, on these A5 flyers. Um, then we've got those, and those represent 50-page, 60-page reports with detailed analysis uh, in them. And then the most recent study we've done, there's another one which is published almost, almost as we speak. You know, in the next few days it will be published. It's going through final, uh, final approval. And that one is about flooding in, in Ireland. So Ireland again, uh, Jay. Um, but uh, we, we did one on farm management in Denmark and we produced this flyer and we don't have the value chain picture on there. And we have a, um, uh, we have a story, we're a very good story. Again, there's a very detailed analysis behind this. Uh, so this represents also a 50-page report um, full of assumptions, 
Uh, we have to make assumptions. We try to be very conservative in those assumptions that they can't be, they can't be challenged. Or if, if they are challenged, then we have a basis for, for adapting those assumptions. But then, because we found we had these, these stories, and again, because of the value chain workshop last year, where emphasis was placed on the story, we started doing these um, short case reports. So now this is a, it's a nice, it's a really nice booklet. This one is about the management of peatlands in the UK. It's, it's six pages, so it looks really nice. The whole story is told there, but this is a 50 page report and this is all there is. And so again, we have a communication issue that we have to solve that we're, we're, we're trying to think about and how to, uh, to get this across. But we really like these, these short cases because the economic case is weaker. We don't go so far into the economic case, but the story is strong. And I think um, from a communications point of view, being able to tell the story is, uh, is, is important. Of course, politicians like numbers and they like big numbers. So that's the, uh, the importance of this for us and what we're, we're trying to do. And I'm really interested to get views from others uh, on this subject and uh, on the communications. Thanks, Steve. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Hood, over to you. OK. Yeah. So I think this is a little bit better. <laughs> OK, thank you for inviting me to participate also on uh, this aspect of uh, the value of uh, Earth observation. Uh, just a few words about uh, the Netherlands uh, uh, Space Office and our activities in the Netherlands. So we represent re our government related uh, to policy making and uh, with, with respect to space, and we have several programs from that. Um, I started myself about 10 years ago, and at that time uh, there were only two people working on downstream applications. We are now with about 12 people. So it means that we have been developing over the last 10 years quite substantially. And uh, now what, what has happened over the last 10 years, I think uh, one of the things that we realized is that uh, we really should, uh, let's say, move from a technology push and research-driven uh, uh, activities towards a more uh, user-demand-driven and market-driven uh, approach. And this means in, in two ways. Uh, that is, one is looking at our government ourselves, is where can Earth observation improve existing uh, operations? And secondly, also, let's say, to the real commercial market, where can we help and stimulate uh, our um, uh, small medium enterprises in the Netherlands and even, uh, let's say, researchers stepping out uh, on universities and starting new companies to uh, develop, in fact, uh, new businesses. Um, so one, one of the things that we learned is, is that there is a huge language problem. And, and it was mentioned, I think, also this morning already, there is a huge uh, language problem between, let's say, the Earth observation community and the market. And the market can be either the government and, uh, let's say, enterprises that are willing to uh, uptake uh, solutions uh, that include Earth observation. So, at least for our, uh, with respect to our government, that is also why we increased in, um, that, uh, in, in capacity uh, in order to engage with uh, the, the different governmental departments, the provinces, the municipality, the water boards. We really had to have a large workforce. Uh, to, to discuss with them, to build trust, and also uh, try to understand what are their uh, problems and needs, and, and, that, and then try to relate that to possible solutions from, uh, let's say, from uh, uh, the, that, that have an uptake of Earth observation. So uh, we have been quite, uh, quite successful in that. We have an uh, innovation scheme for that. It's called Small Business Innovation Research. We did not invent it here. It was, uh, I think, started in the United States and the United Kingdom, and we adopted it in the Netherlands as well. It provides, uh, in fact, a competitive approach uh, to start uh, for a few companies to do uh, feasibility studies and then towards uh, a selection to two companies that have a demonstration to the uh, intended customer within the government. And out of that, the government agency starts to have a procurement process according to European uh, Commission regulations. 
So this is the way how we, uh, in fact, uh, try to, let's say, implement uh, services in our governmental operations uh, uh, that have an uptake of Earth observation. Um, and it was also mentioned uh, twice before, EO is not a solution, it's part of the solution. And of course, it's always very important to understand why unique, why Earth observation is playing a unique role in that solution. And, and that is what we try to advocate uh, to our, let's say, customers, uh, the government agencies. So what is the special asset uh, for Earth observation in that respect? Um, in a similar way, we were engaged with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs a few years, five years ago, and there was a simple question. Oh, great, all these uh, uh, satellites, great, this group on Earth observation, but what are they delivering? What are, are they helping smallholder farmers in the field? I had to say, they don't have, they don't help them yet. All these organizations, they, they have data and, and maybe they have services and they provide knowledge, but they provide knowledge to governments and other international agencies, but it does not flow down to the smallholder farmers. So th that time, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs asks us, okay, but can Earth observation in a way help these smallholder farmers? And now we, we, in, we, we looked into all the different bottlenecks and, and uh, elements that were needed and we came to the conclusion, yeah, we have to uh, bring all different kinds of organizations together, but what is very important in that, you have to engage with organizations that are very familiar with smallholder farmers. These are the NGOs and these are, uh, for instance, agri-business uh, enterprises that has these uh, smallholder farmers as a customer. So if you can start to cooperate with them, then you could start up businesses. So out of that, uh, we have now 23 projects in 14 countries. We have lessons learned, and uh, I put a leaflet over there because I see Stephen is uh, <laughs> giving some signals maybe about time. You will find more information about the lessons learned. And uh, what I can say is that we raised a lot of interest, not only from the smallholder farmers, but also from big finance institutions in the Netherlands now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rud. Um, while well, Maddie's walking over, um, f remember farming is only one of about 15 areas we cover, so we don't just look at smallholder farmers. We also have people in civil society and doing disasters and doing biodiversity and many, many other areas, but your point's a good one. And we did actually have a farmer at the plenary last year, you remember? So anyway, over to you, Maddie. Thank you. I hate slides, but I have some. <laughs> just three. Okay, so I'm Maddie West. I'm the communications manager at the Geo Secretariat. Um, part of my job is to promote what Geo is doing and what our community is doing, but also to promote the value of Earth observations in general. So that covers a lot of what we've been discussing here. It's basically identifying these these case studies, these use studies, use cases, and making sure that they get to the people we want to reach, um, which is one of the huge challenges I see in the community is that we have a million different websites, social media channels, publications, brochures, flyers, where are they ending up? Who, who Are you taking them home from the conference and leaving them on your desk or putting them in the recycling bin and forgetting about them? So how can we kind of make sure that these efforts aren't wasted? So some big news that we have this year is a, a contribution from Switzerland to fund a new geo website. So we're really excited about that. Um, we, we've needed it for a while. This will give a, a chance for all of you to highlight the activities and initiatives you're working on uh, as kind of a living hub, news and information, resources, events. Uh, basically, whatever work you're doing will have a space on the website that will be easy to find, easy to understand. But a huge part of this is uh, the knowledge hub that maybe some of you have heard our new director speaking about. Uh, something that we're really looking forward to is having this curated knowledge hub where we, you people can explore all kinds of different case studies, knowledge, tools, and resources. Um, sorry, so 
something that Nicola said before about writing in the accessible language. This is something that I'm really hoping that this Knowledge Hub will be able to do is take this science, take these valuations and economic language, however you want to write it, and then make sure that it's standardized in a way that people who are reading it actually can understand what they're reading and understand the so what behind the stories that you're telling. Because I can say from, an, from my perspective as a non-scientist, often people send me press releases or news stories to promote. I have no idea why it, why it matters. I'll read what you wrote, and I'll come back to you three or four times saying, okay, but what does this mean? Who cares? Who can use it? You know, giving that little bit of extra information that's important for the people that we're, we are trying to reach who don't speak in the language of, you know, somebody with a PhD in chemistry or uh, marine biology. So we are looking for support from the community to do this because what we'll need is experts on different topics to be finding those impact stories. Now, if you want to use the different techniques you've already developed to determine what are, what is the value of this project or this tool, resource, knowledge, that's fine. But then it's going to be coming through this kind of filter process to say, okay, but what about this is interesting for a broad audience? You can link it to a 50-page document if that's what you produced. You can link it to your own website if that's what you need to do. But to have a one-stop shop where policymakers, decision makers, scientists, uh, interested public can go and search for food security and see all of the different ways that Earth observations are being applied in that area or whatever area that they're interested in. This could be a really important resource for us because when I came on to, in GEO about a year and a half ago, I did a mapping of our communications channels and I found that the GEO community, just our work program initiatives and activities, I think there was over 30 different websites created. Um, 20 plus Twitter channels. So everyone's trying to do this communications work, but it's very diffused across these platforms. So the people who are looking for information don't know where to go. They might end up on your website, they might not. They might come through GEO's website, they might not. But to have a one-stop platform where people can find all of these stories that everybody's producing uh, could be really valuable. And it's something that I hope that uh, we'll have a great deal of buy-in for because it's not something the geo the geo secretariat can do by ourselves because the experts are spread out across the community now there will be a library on this site as well but the the knowledge hub will be more about articles videos um short brief i, I don't know if you can make out what's on there it's just it's nonsense I, you know placeholder text but basically where you can see the highlighted words that would be fully referenced uh in the right hand column there where you have links to data sets, to reports, to whatever further information people might need. So this is kind of the idea that we have in mind. We're hiring a company right now to start putting this together. This is just a mock-up. And we'll be going over this a little bit more in this afternoon's communicators session at 5.30 for anybody who's interested in joining. Uh, but this was the main thing I wanted to highlight here is that the, a lot of the things you guys have been talking about, we're already working on doing this and making it easier for you to get your messages and your stories to the people that you need to get them to. So that's my first invitation. Please uh, get in touch if you're interested to con uh, contribute to the Knowledge Hub. Uh, and also, if you have a communications person on your team, please have them uh, connect with the Geocommunicators Network because we are working to support each other uh, across the network, across the community. Are you cutting me off here? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you've all talked about pretty much the same thing. Um, Jay talked about the stakeholders approaching the government to continue the, the program because of value. Jonah talked about the value to them, so not the value coming out from the, the data producers. Jeff talked about how to communicate results. Rude talked about the language problem between the EO community and the users. And Maddie has just talked about, you know, understanding the so what. So, I'd like to put it straight to you, to the, to the floor. Do you have questions? Does someone have a question they'd like to? Can you go to the mic and? So, um, 
No, the name is Lefteris Mamais. You will be hearing from me just in the next uh, panel. But it's a question actually to Ruth, but also somehow connecting with some of the other parts we have been discussing, especially around sharing of best practice because, and moving from uh, research to business. One of the things that we have been discussing with Jeff, for example, over a long time is that this basically is done in a sense by universities having spin-offs and this then eventually somehow with osmosis with the entrepreneurial ecosystem becomes a viable business. In the Netherlands, you seem to have a good track record in that regard. And I'm wondering, would there be A, an interest, B, a, a method to sort of scale this up and share this, this practice with the rest of the uh, European member states or others as well? So how do you sort of instill this type of spirit to the research community to venture out? And then also, how do you help them actually make it? That's my question. Um, yeah, we, it's a long process. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it took us more than maybe 10 years to, to understand, uh, let's say, step by step, in fact, uh, how the community is acting and discussing uh, with the community uh, how they are behaving, uh, the business enterprises are behaving. So it, it's, in fact, uh, continuously engagement with our sector uh, in terms of uh, what is their ambition, what is their vision, uh, how we uh, per, uh, look at their activities. So we provide them with feedback. So it's a continuous process. We did not have a, um, let's say, a, a methodology or a, a process. So it's a kind of organic process. But in fact, what uh, the elements uh, we, we recognized more or less about 10 years ago, but to change the culture, uh, to change the, the behavior of, of uh, the small and medium enterprises, that takes some time. And, and you have to bring in, and that is what is happening over the last few years. What we see now is, is that because we have a lot of engagement in the Netherlands, we, we have a lot of activities, um, also from this big uh, program from Geodata for Agriculture and Water, we see now that more organizations come to us. Yeah, so we're not stepping to them and, and trying to say, okay, we have a great product from EO. No, they started to become interested in uh, the use of earth observation themselves and they come to us and they say, can earth observation help us? So, and then uh, we, we have an uh, again, an, a communication about their uh, demand. And yeah, we are now, let's say, somewhere, yeah, maybe, maybe still at the beginning of the process. Maybe this still will continue over the next five or 10 years, but it, it's, it's a slow process. And what helps, I think, is, is that uh, at certain moments, people step in and they really see a business. And we have now two or three companies that were established in the Netherlands about two years ago, and that grew from, let's say, two, three persons to 15, 20 persons. And that is, I hope, really, uh, let's say, uh, the way uh, yeah, the, the business enterprises should work. Thank you. Thank you. Does someone else have a question? If you can just say who you are. Hello, um, I'm Nuno Caterino. I'm uh, the coordinator of the Next Year's project, and I'll be in the next se session as well. Um, I just have, would like to mention that, that there is this uh, mechanism for uh, grouping users, which probably is very similar to the one that you mentioned, which is a pre commercial procurement. This was used in the H2020 a uh, couple of years ago. And uh, the call for the, the, there was a project called Marine O that, that is still ongoing, and that selected a few companies and uh, institutions to design a service according to the user's needs. And we're, we're one of the selected companies, uh, my company Demos. So what they do is that they have a user's bias group. They select four um, candidates in the first phase of design of the service, and then they funnel it out uh, until they get to in the end. I think this uh, uh, approach to federating the, the, the services is, is actually very good. And in this case, uh, they're all um, mostly uh, national uh, authorities. 
And my second point is, is regarding the, the goals of uh, uh, Copernicus and GMES. Um, so I think that the Earth observation is sort of a three-step process. First step is R&D, that's already done. Second step is, will, be, will have to be the national uh, authorities that will have to uh, use Earth observation uh, in general or as a day-to-day as a -day business, and then you go to the business-to-business -business because you, only when you, you can only go to business-to-business -business if the, the, the techniques are already very optimized and, um, and very low, low cost or, or profitable. And GMES was actually done in the beginning for the national authorities, uh, international authorities, not for the commercial sector. So is there a question in there or? It's more of a yeah. comment. I, mean, uh, I would like to yes. reflect a little okay. bit okay. very shortly. Uh, the process that you mentioned about the selection from, from uh, let's say, feasibility demonstration and to final selection, that's quite similar to the small business innovation research. So I think that is very practical yeah. because there is no solution yet. And, and together with the end users, you are, in fact, channeling, in fact, uh, the, the most likely uh, and best uh, solution. So. Yeah, I would see it. I see. If there's no solution, this is a very good process. And um, yeah, with respect to what you then said, okay, that you need first to have a let's say good uh, knowledge uh, or algorithms. Uh, so so research come first, and then the next steps that you mentioned. I think we have passed that phase. I think there is already a lot of knowledge, and there is a lot of data out there. So it should be now the other way around. So now, in fact, the market should define what is needed, and then you should have a look at what effect is available uh, from, from knowledge and models, and then create a solution. And then you will have new demands from the market that will drive new research and innovation. So it, it should be now the other way around. We are so, so let, in that phase. Okay, so let me bring it back to the, the topic of the, uh, the session, which is measuring the value of EO. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to just give you all, um, and please keep it succinct, um, I'd like you all to just give me a statement on what you think. How, how do you address this? Jeff said politicians are susceptible. I wish I hadn't used that word. And Jono, Jono said they don't believe. So... How do you get this message across? And Maddie wanted to know the so what. So in, in a statement, what do you think is the kind of the, the one or two pragmatic or practical things we can do as a community working together, particularly in this regional kind of environment that we've talked about? So is that clear? What, what's the kind of one to two things you think we can do to improve the, the communication? Maybe I'll start with you, Jay. Is this working? Yes. Okay. I think there's there's two aspects to your question. One is the degree of adoption. The value is not what we're going to assign it, but it's what the users find in actually adopting the EO. So I, I leave that as just a quick comment. Um, the second thing um, is the question of what happens if you don't have it? Because in a certain sense, absence is also a value statement because people want it. So understanding the traditional economic function of do with and do without is, is a nice way to do it, but it's not effective. But if you say, I don't have this, what's going to happen to my business? What's going to happen to my community and my users? Then that is a value statement. So that goes back to your original statement of it's never visible until it fails. Okay. Thank you. Jono? Yeah, thanks. Um, just want to clarify that what Jeff and I said are actually compatible. <laughs> I didn't say they don't like the numbers. I just said they are smart enough not to believe them. <laughs> that is a subtle but important distinction. We, we shouldn't get... Uh, what, what they like about them is they like the fact that they'll be able to announce the numbers. But in convincing them for the investment, that, that, that's not everything. That's not the whole story. And it comes to my next point, which is what they really like, in my experience, is when they're hearing it from uh, people outside. When your advocates are not yourselves, when they're hearing from uh, the lobby group for farmers, for example, are the ones telling them 
we need you to invest in this. Um, when the mining companies are telling them, we need you to invest in this to help us uh, ensure our social license to operate, otherwise we won't have an industry in the future. Um, I think that that's something we have to get better at and it ties into the language question as well. And, and coming back to the website, I think, I think it's great that we're going to get a new website and I think that perhaps the diversity of websites we've had in the past for specific initiatives uh, hasn't been a deliberate action, it's just something that's ar arisen. I think if we want to talk to different communities in their own languages, we're going to find that very hard to do if we try and do all that through a single, uh, single website. I think we need to make sure we're thinking, and I'm sure that is being thought about, uh, the, the language that works for the farming community and the DRR community and so on is, is actually different. So I think we have to put a bit of thought into, uh, into how we respect that while avoiding some of the problems of the past with 50 websites that, that are just complete chaos and a waste. We know they're wasting resources. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff? Um, yeah, I, I, I certainly buy into the, uh, this, this notion of, of the messages coming from the, uh, from the user groups. Um, very hard to, uh, to achieve. Um, I think we're in the process of understanding exactly who those user groups are and who the communities are. Um, which is part of the um, the value in this this value chain approach. So I think uh, that's going in the right direction. And Jay gave a good example there. Um, again, the, the, the stories are good, but also the numbers are uh, are, are good. And um, providing some some concrete numbers um, as to the the societal value. And I think that it, that is the key. That it's not just um, the value to this this farmer or this uh, this navigator or this uh, um, whatever it might be, uh, maybe climate change scientist. Um, it's the value to society of what's coming out that's important, and so that's that's the, the where we need to uh, uh, construct our arguments. Thank you, uh, Rud. Yes, I completely agree that uh, the best uh, ad advocator for our society is our, the users. In the Netherlands, the National Fire Department is one of the best advocators for the use of uh, the uptake of earth observation in the Netherlands right now. Um, just to give you an example, um, and from, from our perspective, uh, I think uh, as a National Space Agency, we often say that Earth observation is part of the information society, so we are only one aspect of a very large information society. And uh, yeah, Earth observation is only part of the solution. It, said, it has been said before with a yeah, spe specific and uh, unique, uh, unique value. So I think uh, that is what, at least from, from our perspective, we can uh, uh, contribute to the communication uh, aspect. Thank you. And then, Mario, if you want to wrap up. Um, and this far, can you just keep it down? There's live streaming on the video behind you. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I, some of the things that I've tried to, to highlight before were that I think that we need to simplify our language and um, keep it impact focused. Uh, but responding just to what John just said, it's true that different user communities and scientists and different groups have different languages. But I also would argue that there is a common language that we all speak. Um, which you can see if you read you know, BBC Science or anything like that. It doesn't matter if you have zero scientific background, you can read one of those articles on any topic and you're interested and you understand the implications of whatever discovery they've been covering. And I think we all need to take a, take a, a lead from journalists in that regard and look at how they communicate what they're working on or what a scientist has been working on because that is how you tell a story and the way that the scientific community tells stories generally isn't that interesting to most people. It's, you know, very, it's like reading a school report. So I think we could all do a little bit better in, in that regard. And it's not that hard to learn. I put uh, five steps, I think, to better writing in the geo branding guidelines. And they're pretty simple things that everybody can practice to do a little bit better in the way that they write, putting the, the uh, significance up front and things like that. Uh, the other thing that I would encourage is investing in communications, whether you're an organization or an activity. It's not leaving it as an afterthought, but putting it into your planning, thinking about, okay, what are we going to need to do around comms for this activity or this, um, for this project? 
Uh, and if that might mean you, if you have the budget for it, having a communications team, that's great. If not, try and set aside some staff time. Running a Twitter channel is not something you can just do, you know, after work. It's something that takes time to keep it going. Uh, if you have a website, you know, obviously you need someone who can run the website so that it doesn't uh, become stagnant and, and die off. Uh, because that does make us look like we're not doing anything if we have communications channels that are not being updated or have old information on them. Uh, and also capacity building. It, just because you're an expert on whatever technical topic doesn't mean that you can't also have skills in designing a better PowerPoint presentation that doesn't confuse people or writing a little bit better or those sorts of things. So I think we all have work we can do in there and the Communicators Network is here to support you. We're 80 plus communicators working within GEO. Uh, so there's probably someone in your organization that, that can help you out if you need it. Okay. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for uh, their time. You're now free. All right, so konnichiwa, everyone. I was waiting for a long time to say this. Um, and now it's our, our turn. So this is the final session of today. We will be looking into uh, ways to develop the future, of course. We have been discussing this more or less over the past uh, three sessions. Um, I will invite, of course, everyone to uh, sit up here, but I see that some of the panelists are not in the room right now. Uh, so maybe so that you can also see better the introduction presentation. Uh, you know, take a minute still at, at your seats and then I will invite you to uh, join the panel and we can have the discussion. So just to remind everyone of what is the scope of this final discussion, basically we want to look into three things. One is the ways to, discuss, to design long-term and hopefully high-impact <coughs> actions for the uptake of Geos and Copernicus. Uh, we will share a little bit of the uh, lessons learned and the insights we had uh, through the GeoCradle. The second is to see how we can identify and work on sustainable synergies and cross-fertilization models. And the last part, which has been discussed in different ways so far, is how can we match the programmatic view with that of sort of the grassroots, the, the things that are happening on the ground. So um, I would start first by presenting you a little bit some of the things around the GeoCradle roadmap for the future implementation of Geos and Copernicus in the three regions that we have uh, worked on. Just for everyone that doesn't know me, I'm Lefter Jomais, I'm here as the technical manager of GeoCradle, and we have been working on this. It's still not published, but I can already tell you that the first page will look like that. So uh, here you have a, a first side of that. Now, um, I will only touch upon three main topics, and even those uh, I will sort of run through because there's not enough time and the point is not to listen to me, but to really have a lively discussion. So I will touch a little bit upon the methodological approach we have followed, look into some of the key challenges that we have identified across the countries in this region, and present you with some of the recommended actions in a sort of compact format. So for the first part, and without going into great detail in every of those little blocks, the methodology we developed to basically have this roadmap uh, coming into life is that we started by first understanding what's happening in these regions and in these countries. We did this by running a gap analysis. This was quite thorough. Of course, it used many different sources to uh, substantiate its findings. We also did the EO maturity indicators, which uh, Monica presented earlier, and it allowed us to have a sort of snapshot of the current maturity in each of those countries with regards to their earth observation activities. And of course, we have used all sorts of documentation from the programmatic level at GEO, GEOS, Copernicus, and so on and so forth. So all this was sort of merged together and together with the insights we had from project partners, because here is also in a sense the benefit of having a project funded by the European Union in our case, but so sort of a large scale project, because you have enough money to bring in a big, good team where you have people that can allocate time and, and sort of share their expertise 
find the data and substantiate what we, uh, what we want to be looking at. Uh, the same applies with external ex experts. We were able, through the network of GeoCradle, to reach out to independent experts, so not the team itself, but others, to validate what we're doing. And eventually what we try to do is to, A, construct what I call a thorough picture of the current state of play, B, identify key opportunities, and also see what are major weaknesses that need to be informing future actions. And finally, uh, define who, what, when, and how in a concrete action plan, because the point there is that you can supply the, the decision makers, in our case, commission and, and also the geo community, but also individuals within this ecosystem with something concrete that they can work on. So these are the key challenges. I'm not actually going to um, speak too much about it because it has been covered, just the titles, fragmentation, it has been touched upon by France and others earlier today. The lower, low awareness still of potential benefits, it was actually the, the subject in a sense of the previous session. The uh, exploitation of big data and, and the data management practices is more on the technical side. Skill shortage, and actually here, one interesting thing which is sort of particular to the regions that we're looking into is what I have called ephemerous workforce, meaning that either you have people that through capacity building are trained and then they're leaving the countries to go uh, to more advanced, let's say, from an Earth observation point of view countries, or vice versa, you have, for example, Europeans going to some Arab states, they work there for two, three years, they do good things, but then they leave and there is again a new gap to be filled uh, in these countries. And finally, this notion of helping commercialization and innovation uh, on the basis of R&D results. So with this as a background, this is quite a complex, I, I don't know if you can really uh, see much uh, from where you stand. Okay, if not, let's play a little bit with the colors. So the idea here is that so this is, a, in a sense, a four-dimensional graph because you have the what. These are the main categories. I will read them out for you. It's infrastructure and data exploitation on the top left, the earth observation and support to policies, ecosystem capacity building, earth observation services sustainability support, and finally, uptake. So these are the five main areas, the five main dimensions in which the GeoGradle roadmap is built. And in each of those, we have tried to identify concrete actions either in one to three years time frame, which is the first column, if, we, if you wish, the most, uh, the bluer one. In the middle, we had three to six years. And finally, it's the 2030 perspective. Then we have the who, and the who is uh, denoted here by these little uh, colored uh, circles. And basically, we have been looking at who is going to be impacted by these activities. And this, in, in our case, it's industry, scientists, users, and policymakers. And okay, now you cannot really see any of those things. And again, apologies for this, but uh, it was also difficult to put all these things in one slide together. The point is that we have been looking at things, for example, such as ensuring the EO presence in non-EO initiatives. To give you a very concrete example, there is the PRIMA. It stands for Partnership for Research and Innovation in the Mediterranean Area. This has been, from the get-go, driven by needs in the Mediterranean area, in, in actually agriculture and water resources management. There was no EO push as such in it. But of course, when the challenges and the, the needs to overcome them were sort of fully fledged, the realization that Earth observation could be part of the solution came into the picture. And that's where one needs to step in, in terms of a roadmap, in terms of concrete actions, to ensure that this type of activities have this flavor as well. Another point that is a little bit European, but hopefully it will slowly become sort of replicated also at a geo context, is that of having structures that are operating at a national level. They are getting information from the ground, relaying it back to the programmatic level, let's say, and also doing the other, uh, uh, you know, the other way around. And in, in Europe, we are now building the Copernicus relays. Uh, some of these actually relays are even uh, set up outside of Europe by now. I don't know if it has really uh, been yet done, but it's in the process of being done. And the point there is that if we had con a convergence, for example, of geo offices functions or other entities with those of the relays, you could have a nice synergy. So these are the type of things we're looking at. This will be published hopefully by the end of, uh, of November. So this is something that all of you will be able to access. And 
With this, I then invite Nuno, our, our friends from Afrigios, Vagelis, and the rest of the panel to, uh, to join up here so that we can have a lively discussion. Yeah, please take a seat. And Angelica, hi. Good morning. So we'll just go back to the points we want to be discussing. All right, so since we're a little bit late in, in starting this uh, final session, let me ask you to be brief in the first question. The first question is addressed to all of you. You will not see the questions there. Uh, I will be uh, yeah, bringing them up for you. But so if you had to choose one thing to support the effective delivery of first observation benefits to users, what would that be? And you know, whoever wants can start first, and then uh, we can move forward. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's now on. Uh, my name is Andy Swamlesa uh, from the South African National Space Agency. So since I'm sitting in the first line, <laughs> the first one, I won't pass the mic. Um, so considering that for, if I talk specifically for South Africa, policy and strategy are in place. So the one thing I would personally do, and also with the position that I'm in, I've got uh, second levels of capability or powers to do is to establish an, an effective infrastructure platform for delivery of data and products and services. Right. So it will be more the infrastructure. This, uh, I'm Angelica Gutierrez. I'm from NOAA in the US and I am from the Americas. Um, the first thing would be probably increasing capacity building uh, way, way down uh, into the college and universities um, because we are uh, the point the, the point that you made of doing the capacity and people leaving, then we are doing capacity at the wrong level. So we need to start going even further down into the capacity building. Okay, in my perspective, I think the most important thing to do is that make sure that you are actually addressing real needs of the users. Mm -hmm. So before starting delivering to, to, to the user community, I think it's, it's important that you first identify and tailor the solutions to real use. And then it's also important that while communicating these uh, solutions to the users, uh, that you are able to, ben to demonstrate other best practices and benefits coming out of the use of the solution, so that they are more willing uh, to to adjust and uh, make use of them. That's my feeling. Okay, I'm the last one, so uh, the same as they said. <laughs> so uh, now I think it, uh, regarding infrastructure, for example, I think it's it's uh, quite advanced to some extent. I agree a lot with the capacity building aspect. I think it's it's very important to go to universities and get get them to understand not in uh, Earth observation the master's degrees, but in uh, all, all other um, areas what is the potential of uh, Earth observation. But I stress the point that I, I made uh, a while ago. I think that the 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 R and D uh, the R and D step of Earth observation is already done. So we already have a lot of knowledge. Now we need to move to the national, international authorities and to get them to use and to federate the usage uh, in terms of uh, national and international authorities um, over Earth observation mm -hmm. um, systems. All right. Okay, I mean, uh, you know, in a sense, even this last part is touching upon, okay, maybe not in the, in the current time, but in the future, if we're speaking of training the workforce of the future and, and attracting also uh, 
uh, let's say, young generation of different disciplines towards the Earth observation uh, community. But if we look now into the what I call at least the disconnect between the demand and the supply side, because also, Vageli, you mentioned real needs, and maybe starting with Andiswa, how, you know, what, what would be the way for you, or what is the way you're actually pursuing in South Africa to match those two sides? And are there any best practices that can be shared, that can be readily replicated elsewhere? So the, the, I mean, the, ma the major thing on, the, on, on, on getting to a point where you can find a way of merging these two, one is identifying the coordination and facilitation um, um, call it organization, structure, or mechanism. You actually have uh, to have any, in the case of South Africa, we have the South Africa uh, Geo, and if you look at the intentions around Afro-Geos, that was one of the things. It's a coordination mechanism mm -hmm. um, that could uh, look at systematic user engagement, and I'm saying engagement because it's not necessarily just the user requirements, because sometimes when we're talking user requirements, we end up just putting surveys out and, and, and thinking that we've now done the user requirements, but it's, it's the consistent engagement with the users uh, on top of the surveys, bilateral and multilateral engagements, um, where you're looking for, first of all, what is the policy mandate of the, of the user community that you're trying to, to support? Uh, what is the information requirements that is required for that policy uh, to, be, to be implemented, monitored, because there's the evaluation uh, aspect around, around the policy. And sometimes we get to even get to a position where we're even able to inform the update of the policies mm -hmm. uh, based on those, on those engagements in terms of actually the minutes, the ministry is aware of the existence and the impact of earth observations, the policy can be um, updated to make sure that earth observation is actually inclu included in the implementation of the policy and the monitoring and evaluation aspects. So the chain for, for, the, for the user engagement is understanding the policy mandate, understanding the information requirements, and then what are the observational requirements, which then for us as space agencies, we start talking about the sensor specifications. Mm -hmm. uh, most often we've started on the other side, as the space agency, we build the satellite and we say to the users, yeah, it is now go away and use it. Um, uh, but now we're trying more and more to, to engage, especially with our engineering counterparts, to actually say, firstly, there must be the user needs in place, uh, which we understand from an information and observational requirement, which must then inform the sensor, the sensor, specific, sensor specification. But also what we face, also face with is that user, user needs are not constant, uh, as well as because our policies are not constant, uh, uh, they, they, they're changing. So the systematic en uh, engagement enables us to stay in touch with the changes in the user needs. Um, but what we also have found is that the more uh, smart the user is in terms of understanding the value and the impact that Earth observation is, their requirements go up. Mm -hmm. So in a way, from a demand side, is you engage with the, with the supply side in terms of how does the supply side stay up to speed with the change in the level of adaptability of the user to earth observations, but then also how do you progressively, so as your user get, is getting smarter, how do your products and services match up with the level that the user, that the user is at? The promotion is, an, is the next part uh, uh, in the user engagement, having concrete case studies that, that the users have. We found that what also works well for us is to actually getting other ministries to actually talk to other ministries. So we've got advocacies within the, the community. So for example, the statistics uh, our community. So uh, it's been very good at advocating for ensuring that the South African National Space Agency, for example, is the sole, not sole, but mainly the coordinating factor in terms of the acquisition of satellite data, that people do not go out and buy on their own and, and get data wherever they want. Um, the Ministry of Water and Sanitation is very good at illustrating how we can use Earth observations for monitoring uh, and validation of water usage. So how the tools have enabled them, because no, we no longer have water police in the country, where people go out and actually check whether the farmers are using the water they're supposed to be using. So the, the policy now uses earth observations to check 
the farmer is, is allocated so much water, but if their area of irrigation is that big, it can't be that they're using only the water that's been allocated. So, so having the other ministries actually put out their case studies and inform others has been one of the main, uh, main ways that we've, we've found works. On the supply side, it's, um, we're starting with the question that they always, uh, most entities always ask us, you know, tell us what are the requirements of government? What does government want? Because in terms of developing innovative solutions, I think the capability is there, but how, how do you get to develop a solution that's going to be used? How do you get to develop a solution that can be taken to the, to the market? Uh, and how do you develop a solution that is sustainable beyond the 2030 agendas that we're talking about uh, 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 now? So, so the, 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 the connecting factor I think we found for us is, is being a, a, a coordinator around and the matchmaker between, between these two. So we build, we're trying to build a competitive environment. We call it co-opetition. So it's for collaboration, cooperation, uh, competition, coordination, <laughs> so it's, it's, four, it's four C's, uh, co co competition, yeah, it's four C's, um, because we find that there the, the are a number of innovative entities, especially the startups and entrepreneurs um, that are coming up, and, and they, all they're looking for is, what is it that I can do that would be useful? Uh, who would actually use this, and how do I get it to them? So, so we sort of like play the user requirements providers. We also play the matchmaking in taking those products and services uh, to, 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 to the market. But I think for me, uh, what embeds all of this is the communication. It's actually talking to the demand side and talking to the supply side. Um, the supply side also comes up with a lot of requirements uh, as well in terms of the kind of infrastructure they would need, especially if you're dealing like with our environment in the continent, we do not have well-established companies that provide uh, products and services using earth observation, so it's still more entrepreneurs and a startup community. So infrastructure, the reason why I put it up there is because it's an enabler for us. You know, it's no longer access, it's no longer the cost of data. I mean, like I've said this in the past three years, it's no longer the cost of data that's the challenge for the continent. We've got plenty of data, but we do not know how to, we don't have a platforms to access this data. We don't have platforms to process this data to a point where we can actually provide sustained solutions. It's still this hit and run solution, you know, because they're still project based, the solutions that we're providing. And more and more government is not operating like that. But to increase the supply side, because it's very limited, the, the people, the number of people or entities that are playing on the supply side is quite limited. To increase that, we need to provide a platform that, in, that starts to level out the field in terms of coming into the, into the, into the environment. So the infrastructure and the engagements for me are the major, are the major things that we have found. If we can actually uh, deal with those be, get better in, 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 in engaging and listening uh, um, and responding to what is being asked for rather than what we think we would like to give um, is, is one major thing that we've learned. And, uh, and the next one is if we can put the infrastructure, then we'll have different issues or different challenges to deal with. All right, thanks a lot. I think you really opened many interesting uh, points which you know, would render a discussion in their own. Um, Hopefully we'll come back to some of those. Uh, maybe just to sort of bridge with the, the supply side of the panel itself, so with, uh, with Nuno. You have been involved in Next Geos. There has been this, in principle at least, process of engaging the users, getting the co-design uh, sort of embedded in the whole process, trying to understand their needs and develop the services towards these needs. Now, and this also says about you know the dynamic evolution of those uh, requirements. So, how is it working out in next years? How do you see those services transforming? Well, the pilot services, I mean, transforming into actual commercial, per perhaps uh, ventures. Okay, just a, a few words about about uh, what next years is. So, uh, it's a it's a it's an European product, a project uh, with 27 partners. So, we started uh, about a year and a half ago and we still have uh, uh, 20 months to go. Um, what we're doing is actually comes from a stream of activities that we've had since 2012, which is developing 
a baseline set of tools and uh, access to cloud uh, infrastructure, um, vendor independent cloud, cloud infrastructure for services to be deployed. In Excel, for example, we have 10 and we have an open call for more services to be to be added to the to the project. So we have budget to increase the, the number of, of projects. We have more than 10, uh, we have selected one, and we have more than 10 now uh, applying for, for being uh, an Excel pilot uh, service. So this is basically what Nexus is, and we're also cataloging data from, from projects and linking to, to activities. So I would go back to one of the, the questions that were mentioned before and uh, that you also mentioned in your presentations is the fragmentation of the EO market across countries. I think this is, a, this is a big issue because there is infrastructure, for example, for example but it's not uh, uh, necessarily where the, the users are. Uh, so this uh, fragmentation, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge blocking to the growth of Earth observation. Um, and I think by, by um, international cooperation, namely in the, in the scope of GEO, and GEO does have a, a huge role to do there, um, you can possibly uh, have some specialization of different countries in different areas. Mm -hmm. I know that no country wants to lose the, the, leads, uh, the lead on, on, on technology on, or on uh, development, but uh, I think we have to break this barrier because, uh, I mean, satellites go around the world. They just don't, they're not usually uh, 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 fixed in one country. So if you don't provide global services, then you never go, for example, to commercial services because the, the services that, that we provide in Earth Observation will be very low cost services for the, for the commercial se sector. So first you need to go global. Um, and then you can, you can provide uh, commercial services um, in, in the open market. All right, that's, that's, uh, that's quite an interesting thing. I mean, we have been uh, actually even in, in, in the context of GeoCradle looking in the notion of internationalization, export promotion, and so on, in, also in the sense that we have been studying a market in a sense. It's not really a market as such in, with regards to Earth observation needs, but of course they have their own priorities, their own challenges. They need certain uh, types of solutions. And as you mentioned, in some cases, for example, even in South Africa, we, we hear now from Andiswa, the, the maturity of the industrial sector is not there yet, you know, fully fledged. So perhaps they can use uh, services that are coming from elsewhere. And uh, I think next years in that regard could also perhaps look into this internationalization uh, perspective. Um, looking a little bit in the other uh, um, side of, of, of the same coin, because one thing is to, you know, understand what's happening at the at country level, at, at the user level, also building in, on that basis, the different types of services. So there I would like to draw on Vagelis's experience because you have been running the uh, geo office in Greece uh, for quite a few years now, and you have been actively trying to engage with the different parts of the stakeholder ecosystem. And the question basically is, how can the impact of these national structures be increased also vis-a-vis -vis this whole discussion of matching, for example, the supply with the demand side? Okay, I think that uh, the, the importance of the role of the national offices is increasingly uh, getting much more into, into the play and we have also these discussions in Eurogeos and other frames and uh, we are looking into this. Uh, also we had an earlier session uh, today with respect to the uh, use of earth observation for the support of the SDG frames and again the role of the national focal points uh, was uh, apparent uh, there. So in our case, I think that uh, what the national focal points do is uh, act as an interface to bring down to the national level uh, global practices and best practices uh, along the whole uh, chain from demand uh, to supply, and this is very important. And the other way around is that they can grasp the local needs and then search for these practices at the global level and try to find best fit solutions for, for, for the country itself. So the national focal points can actually canalize all important information to make this happen at national uh, level. 
Then at the national level again, it's uh, the entity that has the mandate to, to bring together the stakeholders coming from the EU community, from the, from the SMEs and the policy uh, making, and uh, discussing with them, but also all together, try to delineate uh, all the gaps and all the challenges uh, in the whole chain between demand and supply. This is also an important thing, because as soon as you have delineated all these relationships and gaps and challenges, then you are able to, 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 to find funding opportunities and bring them together, because when you have the fund, then you start concretizing, you know, these mm -hmm. efforts and uh, capitalizing uh, past uh, uh, outcomes. And at the same time, it is important that you also engage with stakeholders because you don't need to go again with uh, project uh, duration solutions. You have to somehow to make sure that all these solutions are sustained uh, also after the project uh, lifetime. And at the end of the day, it's also important that the national offices uh, use their mandate and role to demonstrate concrete examples and success stories because this helps amplifying the effect in the countries, but also help other countries replicate some of these best uh, practices and make some, through some domino effect, which is very important also. And just as a follow-up question, perhaps, do you see a sort of mechanism going forward that this would be streamlined, this type of support? Because you mentioned that you see that it, there is an increased recognition, but in practice, how is this going to work out? Yeah. Uh, currently, not uh, many countries have uh, region, national, uh, official national offices. Even if they are very mature, for example, we have the example of Australia, that they are very mature in the use of earth observation in many domains, however, they don't have a national focal point except from their PI. So okay. You can listen. <laughs> <laughs> this is for you directly. <laughs> no, uh, we had this. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> okay. Uh, no matter whatever the maturity of the national focal points is, I see that if we come along a common way that national focal points work and make them, even at the regional level, talk together, for example, we have Eurogeos, and we have this discussion of building national focal points in main countries, and most important, having them discuss between them and apply common ways to facilitate all this interaction between the Eurogeos or the geo-level information uh, downstream to the national level. I think this is the way uh, we should be looking at it. And, and sorry to uh, remain, just to, uh, one yes or no answer perhaps. Is there a clear mandate for this type of structures of what, they, what their mission would be? Yeah, it should be. There is a clear mandate. In my mind, yes. It's uh, like, uh, I, for me, the, the, the key word is interface. I mean, I cannot uh, be uh, the earth observation uh, part or the decision-making part. I have to interface as the director of a national focal point between all those that can do this job uh, better. Okay, but then, despite the fact that there is a clear mandate, there is still some sort of challenge that stops certain countries from picking up this role and this function within the country. Of course, inertia and bureaucracy is part of the answer, but I suppose. And this then allows me to sort of jump to the next point, and I wanted to ask Angelica, I know it's a little bit of a challenging question. It is about challenges, by the way. And so, looking into shaping a, an ideal Earth observation future where you would have perhaps an integrated value chain, the users would know about the benefits, they would be you know, receiving them uh, on, on a sort of continuous base. You know, what's, what's stopping us from doing that? And, and what, what should we do? What, what's the experience from the Amerigio side? I feel like I'm in the wrong place <laughs> when I hear my colleagues talking about it because uh, I don't know. I'm going to try to start in a coherent way for Amerigios. Uh One of the beginning of the issues is the fact that we have the geo principles from so many backgrounds. Um, and so Earth observations are, you know, it's important to them depending on where they are coming from. So if they are from the HydroMed service, then they, are, they care about some type of earth observations. Uh, if they are from the foreign office, there is also a, a certain degree of importance about earth observation, and not only that, the political power for the geo principle to be able to uh, engage other organizations at the national level is, is a major challenge. So that's the beginning. 
um, because of our, you know, the, the voluntary nature of GEO, it is difficult to say, you know, all the GEO principles will have to be from A, B, C, or D. We, and so we have to accommodate with whatever we get in the countries. Um, that's one piece. Number two, um, the 15 country members in the Americas have uh, public policies of open data. How many of those really share the data? Uh, I don't know, I would say one third, and that would be a big, a big number. Um, then we go into the capacity, uh, capacity of the institutions. In the Americas, there is very good capacity in the institutions, um, and so there is no need for an external organization or international organization to come and do the job for them. There is the need to build capacity inside, you know, to take them to a higher level from where they are. Um, but usually that's not the case. So it's, um, it's, it's an evolution. I mean, uh, if I look back to where GEO started, the important part was observations. Throughout all these years, we have evolved as an organization. And that evolution is now forcing us to look beyond of our observations. So now we are turning into services. And I can talk about, you know, GeoGloss specifically. In GeoGloss, we have gone beyond observations water into global services. And because there is a global service, now there is a win-win situation for those countries where we have those services. And so for those countries, there's no issue for them to share the in situ data, for example, because there is a win-win situation. Mm. And that's where I think that it's not a mistake that GEO has done, it's just that you know we are evolving and we are now at that point where we need to start in terms of services and services is going to push the networks, the observational networks, is going to help to advance that because observations per se alone don't have a value until you put a service and a reason of that to that observation. Um, so is, you know, in the Americas, that's our experience. What, it's just an evolution. We have to adapt deal with the limitations that we have at the national level. When we talk about regional, when we created AmeriGeos, we said we are going to work on these priority areas. We are going to work together in water, together in biodiversity. That's not the case. Together in disaster, that's not the case. Every single country invests tons of money, for example, in the area of disaster. So it is very difficult to say that we are going to have a single regional approach to disaster. And, and so what we are learning to do is to adapt and, and to work with the limitations in, in, in what we have, the resources we have. So I don't, I don't think that the question should be what is stopping us to you know, realize the uh, benefit of observations, we are working on that. It, and, and what we need to accept is, is that it's an evolution. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a constant evolution. All right. Um, actually, one of the points you made at the end triggers my next question. It's probably to you and, and Andispo, but anyone else that wants to pitch in, even from the audience, of course, feel free. Because in our case, we had a European-funded project. It had a specific, let's say, um, statement of work, if I can call it like that. And at the end of the line, we were looking into building something coherent because exactly we were sort of covering three regions that were very diverse, mm -hmm. the Middle East, the Balkans, and, uh, and North Africa. And this gave us sort of an impetus to look into 
you know, putting all the different pieces of the puzzle together, creating a roadmap, hoping that this roadmap will not be yet another, you know, document in the drawer of someone, but some sort of actionable thing, even in the format of this type of graphics that you cannot really see in a presentation at a geo event. But would you see, in, in, in your both cases, any reasoning, any, any value in, you know, putting all these pieces together, having a roadmap, and this then sort of guiding actions into the future? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, we put together three years ago a roadmap for capacity building. Mm -hmm. And we have been doing Amerigeo's week for the last three years. Um, with a, I think that that's the greatest successful activity in the region. Uh, we said at the beginning we are going to target government organizations all the countries are sitting at the table as equals. There is no, Amerigios is not a donation or a charity. So everybody is sitting at the table as equal. So if we are going to have Amerigios week in country X, is because that country is going to be investing either in in-kind contributions or um, uh, something, but it's going to invest in that capacity building. And at this moment, so we, we started in Colombia, we continued to Costa Rica. This year was Brazil. Uh, every year we have uh, an increased number of participants from outside of the country that is hosting. Uh, one of the things that we have done, we did was to ensure that those courses were certified by a university so that the people who came to the courses were uh, were able to use that as a credit for their work. And that has been a major success because one week of the courses that we provide outside cost about $8,000, $10,000. Um, and in our case, we provide it free. Um, now we have, we are coming to Peru next year. Next year we are going to Ecuador. Following year we are going to Chile. So the countries really see a benefit in, in that capacity building uh, that we are doing. So yeah, it is, it is important to have a, a roadmap, even if you are aware of the limitations in the different areas. I think a roadmap is a must. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a definite must. For, for average years, I think we'd, we'd called it the implementation plan. And for, and for each uh, of the areas that we'd identified as key strategic areas, we then outline how we're going to get to the end goal for, for that. But definitely show sure, the, the roadmap is a, is, is a must. But one of the, one of the key things uh, for, that was critical for Afro Jews in the first years was the, the political buy-in and the promotion of earth observations, getting, getting earth observations into the right policy platforms. Mm -hmm. So whether it's the African Union, uh, whether it's the regional uh, e uh, economic commissions and, 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 and so forth. Um, because now, if you mention to the to the policymakers and you say earth observations, they have an idea what you're talking about. Whereas before, we didn't have that. So that was the one part. The the other part of the of the of the roadmap that was critical for us was the bridging the the gap between the international community and the African community, in particular the geo community. Because at the time when Africa was proposed, is because we had seen the number of activities or projects that are done in the geo platform um, that at the end of the three years or two years of the project, no one knows what happened to the, to the results. Maybe a report was written and submitted. In some cases, a, a, geo port, a portal was developed, but now the project is over. So what's happened to the data? What's happened to the, to the portal itself? Is there a way of it having a life in the future? So the roadmaps are quite useful because they allow you to actually articulate where you're wanting to get into as a group. With all the diversity of country capabilities within, within the group, with all the diversity of cultural language, because <laughs> all of those things come, come into play, and also the diversity in priorities. But there are common things that, um, as a region, we find that we have a similar challenge in. And, and you, allow, you allow within the, the, the definition of the roadmap that the, the adaptation 
world will be different uh, from region to region and from country to country. Um, so yeah, I would say a, a roadmap is, is, a, is, a, is a definite must, yeah. All right. Anyone from the audience wants to pitch in either to that or any other question that you would like to raise? Okay. I see that that's not the case. So uh, let me thank, ah yeah, please go ahead. I have a question for, yeah. for Angelica. Um, you mentioned that you had these uh, courses that you're doing in uh, several areas. Uh, how, how, what's the length of the, the, the courses and how many do you do per, per, per year? So our managers week is a week, one per year, and the courses are usually 32 hours. Uh, very intense, um, very intensive uh, schedule. We try to bring experts, uh, so we reach out to ESA, we reach out to NASA, um, and we have been very lucky uh, to have great contribution from international organizations. So that has been um, very good. Um, what do we teach? Uh, there are courses, for example, in the use of remote sensing for agriculture. So usually, as I, I forgot to mention, um, so the four areas of priority in Amerigios, except for disaster that is starting to evolve into uh, start taking shape. Uh, water is connected to geoglows. Uh, agriculture is connected to geoglam. Biodiversity and ecosystem is connected to geobond. So we, uh, the regional is actually uh, supporting those thematic areas and that has been very successful because the thematic areas engage with the right organizations at the countries, and so they identify actually the user needs. And the courses are then um, user-driven rather than just whatever is available. Okay. If there is no other question, I think we can wrap up this session and then we can have the overall wrap up of the uh, side event. So thank you very much for all your insights. They were very useful. Jeff, I don't know if you want to pitch in with the wrap up or if I should have a first go to the. <laughs> no, it would be me. Okay. All right. So I will keep it short because uh, actually most of you have been here the whole day, so you know what this has been about. Um, I have kept a few notes, uh, which unfortunately I cannot share yet, but we are going to, uh, of course, prepare the minutes of the meeting and then share with all of you. So. Just to recap, today we started by looking into the importance of sustained Earth observation activities. Our focus was the regional level because that's where GeoCradle is coming from, but of course this is applicable in general. And there we, uh, we heard, and actually it was Steve that made a very good point about regional coordination activities being sort of the enabler for the different tiers to connect. And when I speak about tiers, I mean the fact that you have national known EO priorities, a national EO program, and also the continental and international plans. And usually, as, as Steve was saying, the, you know, people in each of those, they are not necessarily speaking uh, well to each other. Uh, the second point was from uh, Monica, actually, that the diversity in EO maturities, it's actually a good sort of information input to regional coordination programming so that you can devise and, and implement more uh, impactful activities. We touched upon fragmentation. Actually, this, this was sort of one of the main themes throughout the different sessions. And we also uh, touched upon the, the long-term, or the need, if you wish, for long-term perspectives, meaning that if you have investment in either umbrella programs like Copernicus or the Digital Earth Africa, or national investments that do run for many years, I think the Dutch example is one of the uh, the best cases we have heard about. This ensures sustainability of many different components of the EO activities themselves. Um, there was a question about sustainability which was then carried on to the second session. So how do we ensure it? Uh, different points were raised about uh, business models uh, uh, being looked at and made sustainable. Continued efforts on uptake. 
and the long-term investment I have already touched upon. Then we moved into the discussion about moving from research to business. This was also a sort of a recurrent theme looking into the sustainability perspective. And there we, we heard a lot today about the fact that companies or other actually actors may lack access to adequately trained workforce or as we can document from our experience in the geocradle um, countries, uh, sometimes this workforce doesn't stay where it is. So this is a, a serious issue. I can say that from the point of view of Copernicus, there is a sort of coordinated approach to that which is called the Copernicus Skills Program. Of course, it's early at, at this point to really tell if this has the impact or will have the impact that we want, but there are specifically dedicated programs that are looking exactly into that direction. And we also heard from Angelica that Amerigios is also running uh, similar activities. Um, in that part, we also heard a lot about uh, the fact that, you know, th there needs to be a sort of sustained business support or innovation support so that you eventually build a sustainability culture. Uh, it's something also that Rude mentioned many times in the case of the uh, Dutch example that you know, you know, you need to sort of much make researchers turning into businessmen with actual businessmen that, you know, may not know so well things about Earth observation techniques and so on, but they understand the market better. Uh, the, the, um, the other recurrent theme, of course, was the fact that for all this to be made sustainable, it needs to bring value to the users, and this value needs to be showcased and communicated in ways that they can understand. And actually, uh, this then carried on to, uh, to the next discussions as well. Uh, bringing myself then to my handwritten now notes. Because I, so yeah, here we go. Um, the, um, the, the, one of the most interesting, at least for me, uh, points today was the fact that, and it was brought up by uh, Nicola, the fact that industry can play a role in sort of, I don't know if it's the last mile, but anyway, it's a, a key mile from the point where you have certain research results to be then communicated in a, in a sort of convincing way to the governmental authorities or other users, and they can actually then listen to that message and really take up this, uh, these services. So that, I think, uh, was, was a very interesting point. Uh, the need to build economies of scale was mentioned uh, a couple of times. Uh, Gerard mentioned it when he was here, and I think that Nuno also alluded to it uh, in his intervention. Um, yeah, and I think that the, the last very interesting point, which has been a recurrent theme in different uh, EO fora, was the fact that there is a lot of services, if you wish, that are offered for free, usually with a time limitation associated with the duration of a project. And then the question is, how can you make sort of these users or convince them that they need to jump onto a non-free model and pay for similar services? Uh, of course, the notion of added value is the, the key there. Um, in the next session, which was a very interesting one about identifying, measuring, and communicating essentially uh, value, we heard that in a sense we need to be combining the classic, if you wish, macro analysis and economic impact analysis, which of course are, are driving uh, politicians to sort of transfer the, the necessary messages and, and be able to justify investments. At the same time, the other side of the story is the sort of bottom up, the micro analysis, the cases, cases that can really tell a story, but also assign a concrete uh, value to earth observation information and then down the value chain, how this information is helping other actors and how this is translated eventually into societal value. Uh, and there, it's of course a very interesting point that often one of the most successful ways to uh, convince somebody of something's value is when they're missing it, when, when it fails, when it's not there. So you can uh, make a key point uh, around that. I also noted, and I wonder if this should somehow become a discussion point in its own, uh, um, the fact that bipartisan support and it, it's not necessarily bipartisan, it could be multi-partisan as well, but bipartisan support to the function of certain key actors around Earth observation activities is ensuring also sustainability and continuity of Earth observation activities in that country. And I wonder how often this is not the case and how often this becomes a blocking factor 
to a certain continuum uh, of progress. Um, also the point that it's not an, an easy way to, or, or there is no easy way to map upstream investments. So let's say we put so many uh, uh, million euros into the Sentinel satellites and how is this then mapped into you know, actual return on investment uh, downstream? This is not an easy thing to do. Uh, I think the Sentinel Economic Benefit Study is a way to sort of communicate on that, but of course it's not the, uh, the final word in the story. Um, finally, a, a point that was also very interesting and it carried on uh, on different subjects was that of language barrier. And by language, I don't only mean the literal language that, for example, we faced in GeoCradle, but also the fact that you have different communities, they have a different background. We even heard that this might be the case between geo principles, so literally within the same uh, geo community you can have different perspectives. But even more, when you're talking about user communities, and I think the point that having non-Earth observation lobbies, as it, was, as it was mentioned, say that, hey, we need investment in Earth observation because it helps the agricultural sector or the mining sector or the water resources management sector or the algal bloom uh, you know, uh, treatment sector, it's, it's a very uh, valuable one. Um, I also take away the notion of this, um, I think it's called the small business investment in research or innovation in research? innovation and research, and the fact that this is not stopping there, but it then links to procurement. So uh, this is something we should also take away. And okay, you have fresh the final discussion, so I'm not going to go through every of the points that were made there, plus I'm told that we need to wrap up. So uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, hopefully this will be the beginning of you know more interactive uh, traction between all of us in the next months. I wish you a great week in uh, Kyoto, and again, thanks for your contributions.